In this video, we're going to cover chapter eight, looking at microbial genetics. And so we're going to start by introducing the structure of DNA. We will talk about how DNA is replicated. We will talk about transcription translation. We'll talk about types of mutations, etc. So all things related to genetics. So we'll start by a few terms. So first of all, what is genetics? Genetics is the study of genes. And there are several components when studying genetics. Um, the first would be what they are. So identifying where the genes are located in the genome, how they carry information. So what does that gene, what does that DNA sequence code for? How is information expressed? Because if we look at an organism's total genome, looking at all of their genetic information, only a small percentage of that genome is actually being expressed. About 1% is what's actually being expressed. And so we need to understand how is that information expressed? Meaning, when is gene expression turned on? When, in, when is gene expression turned off, et cetera. How genes are replicated and passed on. So understanding how the genetics are passed down from generation to generation. Also, we're gonna look at what's called horizontal gene transfer, meaning not just from replication from one generation to another, but also how organisms can share genetic information. So let's start with what a gene is. A gene is a segment of DNA coding for a functional product. Historically, we used to think of a gene as being a segment of DNA that codes for protein, but what we're actually finding is that not all DNA codes for protein. There are some DNAs that code for types of RNA, and those RNAs don't um, form proteins necessarily, but they do play an important role in the cell. And so again, when we talk about gene, a segment of DNA that codes for a functional product. So it could be a protein, it could be RNA, it has to be some sort of functional product. Usually one gene codes for one protein. Now there are some exceptions to this, but as a general rule, usually one gene codes for one protein. And E. coli has about 4,600 genes. This number is constantly changing, and so estimates uh, vary from time to time, but 4,600 is the amount that's listed in a textbook. Homo sapiens, which are humans, have about 20 to 25,000 genes, and so, Interestingly, if you compare humans with Arabidopsis, which is the mustard plant, mustard plants have more genes than humans do, yet we are considered to be more complex. And one of the things that we'll learn is that um, humans, for example, can do something called alternative splicing. They can take one gene and cut it in multiple different ways to give more than one protein from that one gene. So I studied a protein in grad school, and this protein was a transcription factor, which means that it's a protein that regulates which genes are turned on or off. And actually the gene that I studied formed three functional proteins. And interestingly, when we looked during development, those proteins are expressed during different times in development and they played very different roles in regulating transcription depending on when they were expressed um, during development. And so while we say usually one gene codes for one protein, know that that's not always true. There are some exceptions to that. Humans, again, do alternative splicing. And later on, when we talk about how transcription and translation work, you'll start to see why E. coli don't do this alternative splicing. There's a reason that prokaryotic cells don't do this. So we need a few more terms. And the next term is a chromosome. And a chromosome is a structure made of DNA that contains the genes, meaning it's used to carry the hereditary information. And so if we look at this diagram on the bottom here, what you're going to see is that you're looking at a linear chromosome in this case. So if we see a linear chromosome, is that chromosome eukaryotic or prokaryotic? And the answer is if it's linear, we're looking at eukaryotic DNA, right? Prokaryotic cells like bacteria 
have circular chromosomes. And in the case of E. coli, it has one circular chromosome. If you compare that to humans, let's say, humans have 46 chromosomes. 23 came from mom and 23 came from dad. And so these chromosomes are these long linear DNA molecules and they contain these genes. Remember that a gene is a segment of DNA that codes for some functional product. And so on this chromosome, we're gonna have a variety of genes that code for a variety of different functional products. When we look at a genome, a genome is all of the genetic information in the cell. The first organism to have its genome mapped was E. coli. The human genome was completed in 2003. So all the way back 17 years ago in 2003, we had mapped the human genome. Now, just knowing the sequences though, is not enough because that doesn't necessarily tell us what those segments of DNA do. And so a lot more work has gone into studying after, now that we know these sequences, what do these sequences do? What is their function within the cell? If we talk about genomics, genomics is the molecular study of genomes. So again, basically the sequencing of the genome, for example, etc. And then we have genotype and phenotype. Genotype is the genes of an organism, meaning which genes they have. So if we think in terms of humans, our genotype, for example, let's say I oversimplify and I look at eye color. Now, eye color is much more complicated than this, but for the purpose of this example, we will simplify it. So let's say we're talking about um, eye color. Your genotype would be which genes you have. Now, remember that for your chromosomes, 23 came from mom and 23 came from dad. So your chromosomes are arranged in pairs. So for each gene, you, or for, for each, yeah, for each gene, you have two different genes that you can have. You could have two of the same genes, you could have two different genes, but your genotype would have two genes. So if we go back to the eye color example, you could have a genotype where you have one brown-eyed allele. Allele is just an alternate version of a gene. So again, eye color would be the, uh, the eye color would be the gene and the allele would be the variation um, in that DNA sequence that gives us a different outcome. So one DNA sequence could code for brown eyes. One DNA sequence could code for blue eyes. So your genotype would be that you have one brown eyed gene and one blue eyed gene. That's your genotype, it's what genes you have. Your phenotype, phenotype think of the physical characteristic. And that is, it's the expression of the genes. And what that means is that if my genotype is that I have brown eyes and blue eyes, so I have two alleles, two genes, um, my phenotype is based on that genotype, based on what genes I have, what is the physical consequence? What do we actually see as a result of having that genotype? And so the phenotype in this case would be that if a person inherited one blue-eyed gene and one brown-eyed gene, their phenotype would be that they have brown eyes. And so again, this is oversimplified. Eye color obviously is controlled by more than one gene because we don't have just brown or blue. We have so many variations in between, which tells us that there are multiple genes that control eye color. But that example was just to kind of simplify and help you understand the difference between genotype and phenotype. So think of genotype genes. What sequences does that person have? Do they have a brown-eyed gene and a brown-eyed gene? Do they have two blue-eyed genes? Do they have a brown-eyed gene and a blue-eyed gene? And then the phenotype is what we see as a result of having a particular gene or combination of genes. And so that's genotype and phenotype. So what you're looking at here is here is an E. coli and this E. coli has been chemically treated 
And what happened is, is that this chemical causes the DNA to come out. And so what you're looking at is all of this yellow strand yarn looking parts are actually the chromosomes are the one chromosome that's found in that E. coli. And notice that if you look at this, this chromosome looks so much bigger relative to the cell. The chromosomes, if you were to lay it out flat, the DNA is actually a thousand times longer than the cell itself. Yet, that chromosome can package up very tightly and inside of the E. coli, it only occupies about 10% of the space inside the cell. And so what that tells you is that this chromosome is able to pack in very tightly. It's able to coil, it does something called supercoiling, and so it coils and it wraps around and it packages in very, very tightly. If you were to look at human DNA, so human DNA, if you think about your cheek cells that you guys looked at, for example, right? Your cheek cells, you had to use a microscope to look at it. However, if you were to take the DNA out of just one single cheek cell, so one single cheek cell that's microscopic, if you were to take all the DNA out of that one cell and you were to line it up end to end, that DNA would reach about two meters or about six and a half feet in length. So think about that for a minute. Inside your microscopic cell, if I were to put the DNA end to end, it would be taller than I am inside my microscopic cell. If you were to look at all of the DNA in an adult human, and that's about a hundred trillion cells or so, if you were to take all the DNA in your body and put it end to end, the DNA would stretch 113 billion miles. To give you an idea of how massive that actually is, that would take you to the sun and back 610 times. So think about that for a minute. Just think of the scale of this. All of the DNA in your body put end to end the DNA would stretch to the sun and back 610 times. That is massive. The DNA packs in very, very tight. Um, the human genome is about 3 billion base pairs in one cell. So it's that many base pairs along um, the sequence. If a person uh, was typing the human genome and could type 60 words per minute, eight hours a day, it would take about 50 years to type the human genome. So think about that. If you can type 60 words per minute and you do this eight hours a day, it would take 50 years to type the human genome. If written out, a human genetic code would fill the pages of about 200 1,000 page New York City telephone books. Now, we don't use telephone books anymore, but your parents might recall using telephone books. Um, if you're older, I actually did use telephone books at one point, but if not, you can still get a scale. So if you think about how large a telephone book, let's say we're talking about New York City and it's a thousand page book, your human genome if typed out would be 200 of those thousand page telephone books. That is massive. And so that's just to give you an idea of the scale of this. So the DNA packs in very, very tightly. Now, if we look at the E. coli chromosome, remember that the E. coli chromosome is going to be circular. They have one circular DNA. And what you'll notice is this is base pairs. So BP is referring to base pairs. So that's one pair of bases. So like an A paired with T would be one base pair. If we look over here and we see KBP, that's kilo base pairs. So kilo means a thousand. So what you're looking at is that the genes that are found on the E. coli chromosome are color coded. So these blue ones are the genes for amino acid metabolism. So you can see that we have some genes here, some here, and some here. 
if we look at the red ones, the red ones are carbohydrate metabolism. So those are the DNA sequences that are used for carbohydrate metabolism. So here we have one, another, and there's another. If we look at the pink ones, the pink ones are genes for DNA replication and repair. And so notice that to an extent, these are kind of clustered on the chromosome. There's another one out here, but we have this kind of cluster of genes that are used for replication and repair. Lipid metabolism, so we have a cluster of genes here. If we look at membrane synthesis, Notice that those are very clustered. They're all found within a short segment on the chromosome of E. coli. Now in humans, some of our genes are clustered too. And so they're arranged in a cluster and they do something similar, meaning they code for similar types of proteins that have some coordinated function. And so same idea here. So in the E. coli, we have this little cluster of genes that all play a role in membrane synthesis. Now, you might wonder what are these numbers that are on the inside of this diagram? And what that is, is that it takes about 90 minutes for the chromosome to transfer from a donor to recipient. And what that means is that if you recall back to when we looked at chapter three and we looked at prokaryotic cells, Prokaryotic cells, remember some cells can have a structure called pili. And pili is a structure produced by some bacteria that allows bacteria to do conjugation, meaning that two bacteria can hook up and they can exchange genetic information. And so what that means is that depending on the amount of time, so let's say that cells had only hooked up for um, 10 minutes. That means only these genes here would have been transferred. If we get to 20 minutes, it would be all of these. It takes about 90 minutes or so, approximately, to transfer the entire bacterial chromosome. So those cells would have to be hooked up and that would allow the bacteria to transfer its genetic information from one cell to the next. And so this is, again, you don't have to memorize this map of the E. coli chromosome but it's just to give you an idea of kind of what does that chromosome look like and where are these genes found. So throughout this lecture on genetics, we're gonna break this down into three parts. The first part in terms of the flow of genetic information is we're gonna look at what's called vertical gene transfer. And so that means going from a parental cell and that cell is going to replicate and give rise to two daughter cells. So the first part of the genetics lecture is gonna be focused on looking at DNA replication. So how DNA is replicated, how that's passed from one generation to the other. The second part of this lecture is gonna be looking at gene expression. And what that means is now we're talking about the central dogma of biology, meaning how we go from a DNA sequence and we transcribe it to make an mRNA, that's transcription because we're transcribing a similar language. DNA and RNA are both nucleic acids. And then the mRNA is going to code for the protein. And that process is called translation because we're translating. We are going from nucleic acid language to protein language. Those are different types of macromolecules. And so this is translation. And so we're going to look at how gene expression occurs within the cell. How does the cell make those proteins, which give us the phenotype. Remember the phenotype is the physical consequence of having a genotype. So depending on what genes you have, that will dictate what proteins get produced. And if you think about all of the biochemical tests that we've looked at so far, Let's say we're talking about starch hydrolysis. If we're talking about starch hydrolysis, remember we're testing to see, are bacteria able to hydrolyze starch? Can they break down starch as a food source? And essentially what we're testing is, do they produce amylase? Amylase, ACE, enzyme, enzymes are protein. And so what allows bacteria to either make or not make amylase is depending on, do they have the gene? Do they have the DNA sequence? because if they have the DNA sequence, then it can be translated to make that enzyme 
which allows them to do that metabolic process. And so the genetics of it all is ultimately what dictates which metabolic pathways different bacteria can do, why some can do sugar metabolism and others can't. It all comes down to enzymes. Which enzymes do bacteria have? Which ones do they not have? And again, that's all gonna come down to genetics which genes the organism has. And so the second part of this lecture is gonna focus on gene expression. So how do we go from transcription and translation? How does the cell process that information? And then the last part is gonna focus on what's called recombination. And that's gonna be our horizontal gene transfer. And so that's gonna be a transfer of genetic information between two cells of the same generation. So for example, we'll look at a type of recombination that we've already talked about, which is conjugation, right? One cell can form sex pili, connect with an adjacent cell, and pass DNA from one cell to the other. And so that's gonna be our recombination. And so the third part of this lecture will be looking at recombination and talking about how recombination occurs, what types of genes can be transferred along this line, etc. So, biological problem. Where does the cell's DNA go when the cell divides? So if you think about it, if you have, let's say, a cell and it has some genetic information, if that genetic information does not duplicate before the cell divides, you're gonna end up with one daughter cell that has DNA and the other one does not. And so the biological solution to this is that the cell is going to replicate its DNA first. So it's gonna take its DNA and it's going to make an exact copy. And then those two copies are gonna split into two cells. And these daughter cells are now offspring and identical copies of this parent cell. And so bacteria, for example, will do this through a type of asexual reproduction. Remember that they are a single-celled organism. They exist as one single cell. So when they reproduce, they reproduce asexually without a partner. They simply just copy their DNA. Remember that they go through a process called binary fission, and they will divide into two daughter cells, both of which are identical copies to the parental cell. So the structure of DNA was published in a model in 1953 by two scientists by the name of Watson and Crick. And so Watson and Crick published a paper basically proposing that DNA is a double helix. Now their model used several facts to decipher that it's a double helix. And the first is that DNA is a linear polymer of four types of bases linked by sugar phosphate groups. So at the time, scientists had already discovered that there were four types of bases. There was A, G, Cs, and Ts. And they knew that it was sugar and phosphate groups. So they knew that it was sugar phosphates and they knew there were four bases, but they still weren't sure about what the overall structure would look like. The ratio of bases they found, not them, but other scientists found, was that A equals T, G equals C. And this became known as Chardoff's ratio. And that is when they looked at different species of organisms, didn't matter which species they looked at. What they always saw was when they quantitated the amount of A's and T's and G's and C's, percentage of A's always equaled to percentage of T's. So let's say, for example, that overall, when they looked at the nucleotides, they found 30% of the nucleotides were A. That means in that organism, they always found 30% T. Didn't matter which organism they looked at, this was always the same. A equals T, there was 30% A's and there were also 30% T's. Combined, notice that makes up 60%, which means that the remaining 40 was left to G's and C's. And so half was G and half was C. So 20% were G, 20% were C's. So G equals C. And so again, no matter what species, no matter which organisms they looked at, A equals T, G equals C. And so they said, well, hmm, why is it that A is the same 
same percentage as T and G is the same percentage of C. What does that tell us? And so the last piece of the puzzle that they needed in order to solve their model of DNA was that they figured out that DNA is a helical structure with a helix width and base pair spacing that was known from work by Rosalind Franklin. And so Rosalind Franklin was a female scientist and she did a technique called X-ray crystallography. Now this is not an easy technique. She had to crystallize DNA and then subject those crystals to X-ray. And when the X-ray would hit the DNA crystals, the X-rays would diffract and they would produce an image on film. And this is what she got. So when she did this and she took that crystal and she subjected it to x-rays and then put film behind it, she got this image. Now, I did have the opportunity to see Watson talk when he came to UCI, and I will just say in this recording that he had some very interesting things to say on the matter. If you want to ask me more about that, you can. But basically, what he basically said in regards to Rosalind Franklin's data was that they basically, without her permission, they they saw this image in her lab and they basically stole her data. They saw this piece of film and this was kind of the final piece of the puzzle that basically told them that this structure is a double helix. Now I look at this image and I would not have known what this meant, but this X is this double helix. And so when they saw this image, that was kind of their final piece of the puzzle that was the last piece of information they needed to publish that, that DNA is a double helix. So Watson and Crick were given the Nobel Prize for, for this discovery. Unfortunately for Rosalind Franklin, even though her work played a big role in the model of, of DNA, Rosalind Franklin died before they received the Nobel Prize and they don't give Nobel Prizes for people who have already passed on. And so poor Rosalind Franklin never got really the notoriety that came with discovering that structure. You have to think that during this time, she was working with X-ray and they didn't quite know the extent of how dangerous x-rays were, what were good precautions to take. And so as a result of working with these x-rays, she ended up um, getting cancer and she died. And so Rosalind Franklin really never got kind of the, the fame that she should have gotten or the acknowledgement that she, she should have gotten for this discovery. Watson and Crick basically got all of the glory. And you're more than welcome to look up Watson and the crazy things he said over the years. It's pretty outlandish. And again, if you want to ask me more about it later, you can. So I have a little review for you just to kind of review about our macromolecules. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read these out. And then what I want you to do is I want you to pause, try and answer these yourself, and then I will go over the answers with you. So let me read them first. DNA and RNA are blank. So what type of biological molecule are they? What's their class of macromolecules? The monomers that make up DNA and RNA are called blank. So what do we call the building blocks? The polymer is called blank and DNA is an abbreviation for blank. So again, pause your video. When you're ready, push play, and I will go over the answers with you. Okay, so hopefully you attempted this. DNA and RNA are what type of biological molecule? They are nucleic acids. And the monomers that make up DNA and RNA are called nucleotides, right? The building blocks are the nucleotides. And recall that back when we talked about our nucleic acids, when we looked at nucleotides, remember that nucleotides have three parts, a sugar sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogenous base, which we'll talk about more in a minute. The polymer is called, remember from our table, nucleic acid. So nucleic acids, you could also refer to them as polynucleotides. That is technically right as well. Either could be used here for, could be used here. And then DNA is an abbreviation for deoxyribonucleic acid. So deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. And then RNA is ribonucleic acid. So it doesn't have the deoxy part. And so again, we'll talk about differences between DNA and RNA in just a minute. So again, just to review, building blocks of DNA, again, are referred to as a nucleotide. 
and each nucleotide has three parts. It has a sugar, and the sugar is deoxyribose in DNA, or ribose in RNA. So we have our pentose, our five carbon sugar. So carbon one, two, three, four, and five. And again, the deoxyribo comes from the fact that at carbon two, there's no oxygen on that carbon. It's just a hydrogen. If you were to look at ribose, that would have an OH group at carbon two. It has the oxygen. So we have our pentose sugar, our five carbon sugar. We have our phosphate group. We have one phosphate group. So here's our phosphate group. And our phosphate group is on what we call the five prime carbon. It's the carbon that's in the fifth position relative to this oxygen. So that's why I've numbered this carbon one, two, three, four, and five. So we have our five prime phosphate group and our DNA is gonna contain, our nucleotide for DNA is gonna contain one of four bases. A, adenine, G, guanine, C, cytosine, or T, thymine. And so it's gonna have one of those nitrogenous bases. Again, if we're talking about RNA, it's gonna be A, G, U, so RNA doesn't have T, or C, so that's for RNA. And so this is the building blocks of the DNA. Building blocks of DNA get put together to make the polymers, which are the nucleic acids. And if you look at RNA, remember that we talked about that RNA is single-stranded, while DNA is double-stranded. And if you look at a double-stranded DNA molecule, you'll notice it kind of resembles a ladder. It has um, a backbone and it has rungs from the ladder. And the backbone, remember, are the alternating sugar phosphates. So there's sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate going down the strand. And that's on both sides of the ladder. The rungs of the ladder, remember, are going to be your nitrogenous bases. And we talked about that for our base pairing, A is going to pair with T and G is going to pair with C. And so remember that we said that the reason that um, DNA pairs the way that it does is, remember, purines... Uh, shorter name, larger ring structure. Purines are two rings big, while pyrimidines, which have a longer name, but a smaller ring, um, pyrimidines are smaller rings. And notice that if you put two purines together, that would be too wide. If you put two pyrimidines together, that would be too narrow. However, if you match a purine with a pyrimidine, and that's the same going all the way down the strand of DNA, what you're gonna get is a DNA double helix with uniform diameter. And this was consistent with the X-ray data um, from Rosalind Franklin. And so this is just another image of the structure of DNA. Okay, again, remember I said it kind of resembles a ladder, except that this ladder is actually twisting. And that's what we call the double helix. This is just a couple diagrams of different um, structural models of DNA. Um, on the far left, you can see the ribbon model. Um, and in this particular model, you don't see these sugar phosphates, just notations of them. So blue, yellow, blue, yellow. Um, but you can see the base pairing. So you can see G pairs with C, A pairs with T. And remember that we said that the bonds between the base pairs, uh, those are hydrogen bonds. And you're going to see in a minute that that's important because that weak interaction between those bases um, allows for the two DNA strands to separate during replication. The structure in the middle, this is a partial chemical structure. It shows you some of the chemicals that make up DNA. So you can see the phosphate, you can see the five carbon sugar, you can see these nitrogenous bases, but it doesn't show you all of the atoms on the DNA molecule. And then the far right is just a computer space filling model, just showing you the overall structure of DNA. So we mentioned that the two strands of DNA run anti-parallel. And what that means, remember, is that one strand runs five prime to three prime. And the five prime is gonna be, if you look at the sugar, the sugar's numbered one, two, three, four, five. It's a five carbon sugar, remember. And those five carbons are numbered and they're given a prime designation. That's that little line there. So the five prime end is going to be the free five prime phosphate. Notice if you look at the rest of the five prime phosphates along the strand, it's participating in that covalent bond that's joining the nucleotides together. 
So this one's not free, this one's not free, but the only free one is gonna be at this end, and we call that particular end the five prime end. Now conversely, on the three prime carbon, okay, on the three prime carbon, normally you'll have these OH groups, these hydroxyl groups. Notice here, the hydroxyl group is participating in this bond, same thing here and here, but this is the only free three prime hydroxyl group. And so we refer to this as the three prime end. And so if you look at the two strands of DNA, this one goes five prime to three prime. And notice that the complementary strand, notice up here is the three prime end. So here's that hydroxyl group that's free. And on the strand on the bottom, there's your five prime end. And so notice that these two strands run in opposite directions. One goes five to three, the other goes three to five, and we call that orientation anti-parallel. Okay, so anti-parallel means that they run in opposite directions. So, question for you, and I would like you to uh, pause the video and think about the question, and then when you're ready, go ahead and turn it back on. So, what type of bond joins the bases of complementary DNA strands? So go ahead, take a minute, pause it, so if you said hydrogen bonding, you are correct. Okay, and so the hydrogen bond is gonna be the one that joins complementary DNA strands. If we were talking about the backbone joining nucleotides together, that then would be a covalent bond. But in this particular instance, the answer is a hydrogen bond. So let's talk now about DNA replication and how it occurs. When looking at DNA replication, DNA replication is semi-conservative. And what that means is that when you look at an original parental DNA molecule, okay, so here is our parental DNA, and remember that before mitosis occurs, DNA needs to replicate, it needs to make an exact copy. And so that parental strand of DNA is gonna separate, okay, and so the two strands are gonna separate, and remember that's why those hydrogen bonds between base pairs are so important, because that weak interaction allows for the two strands to separate. And so the two strands are gonna separate from one another and those template strands act as a template and DNA polymerase, an enzyme, is gonna come in and it's gonna read the sequence of bases. So where it sees an A, it's gonna put in the complementary T. And where it puts in a C, it's gonna put in a G. And when it reads T, it's gonna put in an A. And it's gonna do that on both template strands. Okay, and so both of the parental strands act as a template to form a new DNA molecule. And so what you get when DNA replication is finished is that you get two DNA molecules and each double helix is made up of one original parental strand, okay, that's the darker blue, and one newly synthesized DNA molecule, that's the lighter blue that you see. And so this is semi-conservative. You're conserving the, the parental, but you're also adding a new strand to it. And so this is just a diagram showing you um, semi-conservative replication. And in this particular diagram, the blue one is going to be the parental strand. And notice that it's opening up. And as it opens up, a new um, complementary strand is synthesized um, by reading the template strand. Now, replication begins at origins of replications. These are specific sequences on the DNA that are recognized by specific proteins. And when these proteins recognize these sequences, they're gonna unwind the DNA. And so they're gonna unwind it, and when they do that, they're gonna form this replication bubble. Okay, and so they're gonna separate the two parental strands, and once they do that, now replication can begin. And it's important to note that if you look along a chromosome, each chromosome doesn't have just one origin of replication. It's not that it's gonna start at one end and go all the way down in one motion. Instead, if you look along a chromosome, you're gonna see multiple origins of replications. And so all of these replication forks, or all of these replication bubbles, are gonna unwind and separate simultaneously, and the new strands are gonna be made in both directions simultaneously. And so what you get is something called a replication fork. Okay, and so the DNA replication is gonna occur. It's gonna go into the replication fork. 
until it makes the new strands and those new strands fuse with one another and now you get these two daughter DNA molecules each one having um, a parental strand and a new daughter strand and on the right here this is just showing an electron micrograph um, just demonstrating this actually in um, in vitro and so you can see here here's our double strand notice here this is our replication bubble and so the arrows denote the replication forks that that's the direction replication is occurring and then down here here's another replication bubble and then again another one down here and so this just shows you that um, this happens simultaneously along the length of a DNA molecule. Now, many important enzymes um, are involved in DNA replication. Helicase, ACE tells you enzyme, helicase is responsible for unwinding the double-stranded DNA. It's the one that's going to separate the two strands. DNA polymerase, polymerize means to like synthesize, okay, so DNA polymerase is the enzyme that polymerizes or makes DNA. And so it's going to synthesize and add nucleotides to the new growing strand of DNA. Now, one of the important things to note about DNA polymerase is that this enzyme can only go in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, meaning that it can only add on new nucleotides to the 3' prime hydroxyl group. And this is going to be important in a minute when I show you a diagram of how DNA replicates. Another important feature of DNA polymerase is that it helps with editing out mistakes. Basically, it's a proofreading enzyme. It's going to recognize if it makes a mistake during replication and hopefully repair it. And if it doesn't repair it, that's when you get mutations. And we'll talk a lot more about mutations later on. DNA ligase, ligase refers to ligate or to put it together. DNA ligase joins small fragments into one continuous chain. And you'll see this again in a minute. So if we look at the way that DNA polymerase works, it works by catalyzing the addition of nucleotides to the growing strand at a replication fork. And when we make the new strands, the new and old strands are anti-parallel to each other, and the new and old strands are complementary to one another. Now, DNA polymerase can only add nucleotides to the three prime end. So notice that if we have our new strand that's being built, we have this free three prime end and DNA polymerase will come in and it will add the nucleotide to the three prime end. It's going to link the five prime phosphate with the three prime end and that is going to form that phosphodiester bond that links those nucleotides that we learned about in our macromolecule chapter. And so DNA polymerase can only add the nucleotides on at the three prime end, which means that the new strand is always made from five prime to three prime. So let's take a look at how DNA is replicated. And the first thing to look at is that if you look at the two parental strands, notice that the two parental strands, five prime to three prime, and the adjacent strand, remember, is going to be anti-parallel going from 3' prime to 5'. Prime. And so as DNA replication occurs, remember that helicase, that enzyme is going to come in and it's going to separate those two strands of parental DNA. Now, as the replication fork, notice that replication fork is going to the left, so it's opening up to the left, and notice that if you look at the template strand, the top template strand, 3' prime is over here, which means that the new strand, which needs to be anti-parallel, this is going to be 5', prime, right, because 3 and 5 go together, 5', prime, and then down here is going to be 3'. Prime. Remember that DNA polymerase only goes 5' prime to 3'. Prime. And so this strand, which is going into the replication fork, we call this the leading strand. and the leading strand is made in one continuous motion. Notice what happens on the opposite strand though. The other template, notice here's three prime, here's five prime, which means that the new strand is gonna be three prime here and five prime up here. Remember that DNA polymerase only goes five prime to three prime, which means it's going away from the replication fork. Notice it's going down and not going into where it's being replicated. 
And so when DNA replicates on this strand, this strand has to be made in these little fragments. And those fragments are called Okazaki fragments. And these are named after the person who discovered it. Now, in addition, because they're made in little pieces, this strand, this new strand, is called the lagging strand. And so when the lagging strand is made, it's made in short little segments. And what you'll notice is that as this replication fork begins to open up, RNA, or I'm sorry, DNA polymerase is going to go 5' prime to 3'. Prime. When it reaches the previous Okazaki fragment, DNA polymerase is going to fall off the DNA, and it's going to go back up into the opening of the replication fork, and it's going to go 5' prime to 3'. Prime. And then it's going to go back up and go 5 to 3 and it's going to go back up and go 5 to 3. And what happens is, is these fragments then need to be sealed. And that's the role of DNA ligase. DNA ligase is going to come in and it's going to ligate or put those two strands together. And so this is just at a very basic level of how DNA replicates. Differences in prokaryotic cells. Remember that for prokaryotic cells like bacteria, that their chromosomes are circular instead of linear like your chromosomes. And so because of this difference, the way that bacteria replicate their DNA is a little bit different. And you can remember that for when we talked about selective toxicity and that some antibiotics target uh, bacterial replication. And so one of those ways in which we target bacterial replication, remember, was by inhibiting DNA gyrase. And so let's talk about how bacteria um, replicate their DNA. And so again, you can see that here we have the origin of replication. And remember that that is where um, replication begins. It's a specific DNA sequence that proteins bind to that recognize, and they start to separate the two strands of DNA. Now, just like in eukaryotic cells, um, at the origin of replication, the replication fork goes in both directions simultaneously. And so what you get is that the, um, the structure of DNA, we call this in bacteria, it's called theta replication. And so theta is a Greek symbol, and the reason they call it theta replication is it looks like the Greek symbol for theta. For bacteria, they use DNA gyrase. And the purpose of DNA gyrase is to separate the two circular DNA and relaxes what's called supercoiling. And so DNA gyrase is an enzyme that bacteria use to replicate their chromosomes that eukaryotic cells do not require because eukaryotic cells do not have circular DNA like bacteria do. Every cell in your body is produced by cell division. Before each cell divides, it must copy its genetic material in a process called DNA replication. Understanding of DNA replication comes largely from studies of E. coli, bacteria that are found by the billions in your large intestine. Let's take a look at how DNA replication occurs in an E. coli cell. As we zoom in, we see the DNA. At the origin of replication, the two strands of DNA separate, serving as templates for making new strands. The result is a replication bubble. The bubble grows in both directions, forming two replication forks. Let's zoom in on one of them. Many proteins work together at the replication fork. Only some are shown. Here, the DNA is unwound, and DNA polymerases, shown in orange, build new strands of DNA. DNA polymerase always begins a new strand by adding to an existing RNA primer shown here in red, that has been constructed first. Original parental DNA strands are shown in dark blue. Newly formed DNA strands are shown in light blue. Because strands in a DNA double helix run in opposite directions, and DNA polymerase can only add nucleotides in one direction, the new strands must be made in different ways. One new strand, the leading strand, seen here in light blue at the top, 
is built continuously. The other new strand, the lagging strand, seen here in light blue at the bottom, is built in pieces. First, let's focus on the leading strand. DNA polymerase builds a new strand of DNA by adding DNA nucleotides one at a time. Each new nucleotide must pair up with its complementary nucleotide on the parental strand. Adenine always pairs with thymine. Guanine always pairs with cytosine. Adding new nucleotides works the same way on both the leading and lagging strands. Each piece of the lagging strand begins with a short segment of RNA, shown in red. A protein clamps the RNA and attaches to DNA polymerase which builds the rest of the new piece as DNA. When the piece is finished, it is released from DNA polymerase. How are pieces of the lagging strand joined together? A different DNA polymerase removes RNA and replaces it with DNA. However, it cannot finish connecting the pieces. An enzyme called DNA ligase joins the pieces together. Growth of the leading and lagging strands continues on both sides of the replication bubble until there are two identical DNA molecules. Although bacteria are very different from humans, the process of DNA replication in bacteria is similar to what happens in your own cells. So we just finished talking about how DNA was replicated, and now we're gonna move on and talk about how proteins are produced. So, DNA can encode the information for a huge number of proteins used by living things because the sequence of bases along DNA's handrails can be laid out in an extremely varied manner. And for a long time, um, scientists always thought that um, protein is probably the genetic information because if you think about it, proteins, there were 20 different amino acids, whereas DNA, there were only four types of bases. Um, however, many, many experiments showed that in fact, DNA is the genetic information. And the sequence of bases along the strand of DNA um, are used to code for particular proteins. Uh, if you change the sequence of DNA, it's gonna change and code for a new protein. And so, depending on what the DNA sequence looks like, it's going to code for a particular protein. Now, we talked about genetics, and we talked about genotype and phenotype. And remember that we said that the genotype is the genes that an organism has. And so the genotype is encoded in its sequence of bases. So what, what uh, nucleotides in a row? Now, the phenotype, remember, is the physical consequence of a particular genotype. And basically what that means is that the phenotype is a result of what proteins are being produced. And so if you look at the central dogma of biology, we start with DNA. DNA, remember, is the genetic information. It's what's passed from your parents to you. And when you started, remember that you were a single cell and that one single cell divided into two and two divided into four. And so DNA is able to replicate itself. Every time a cell divides, the DNA, can the DNA can replicate. Now, what makes DNA so important, however, is that that information that's encoded in the DNA is used to ultimately code for a particular protein. And the way that that works is that DNA codes for RNA, and specifically mRNA in this example. And notice DNA and RNA, these are both nucleic acids. So we're going to transcribe a similar language. And so this process is referred to as transcription. We're going from nucleic acid language to nucleic acid language. Translation, on the other hand, is where we go from mRNA, and that mRNA is going to code for proteins. Notice this is translating. 
right? We're going to go from RNA, which is a nucleic acid, to proteins, which are proteins, right? And it's made up of amino acid language. And so we're translating, similar like if you were translating, let's say, from English to Spanish. Translating, let's say, from English to Spanish. And so we're going to go from one language to another. And so in this way, DNA is used to code for proteins. And so genotype, the DNA, is going to influence phenotype, which are the proteins that are produced. Now, a genome is all of the cell's genetic information. And a eukaryotic genome is broken up into chromosomes. And remember that each chromosome is one long DNA molecule. So if you look at your cells, in your cells, your somatic cells, right, all the cells in your body that are not used for reproduction, your somatic cells have 46 DNA molecules, right, 46 chromosomes, and each one is one long DNA molecule. Now, if you look at a particular chromosome, along the chromosome are what are called genes. And a gene is a specific sequence of nucleotides that codes for a protein or an mRNA molecule. Okay, so it's going to be the coding portion of the DNA. And only a small percentage of the human genome actually codes for proteins. Um, only about 1.5%. So if you look along a chromosome, you're going to go along a chromosome, you're going to see these genes that are spread out and spaced along a eukaryotic chromosome. Now, the flow of information is going to be DNA codes for protein. And so there's a little analogy to help you kind of think about how this works. So let's say that my genome is like a collection of all of my cookbooks, right? So all of the cookbooks that I own have recipes in them, and they give me instructions for how to make certain recipes. And my recipes, right, my, the, the food that I actually am able to make would be like my protein. And so my cookbooks code for what food I make. Now, if you look at one cookbook, okay, one cookbook could be like a chromosome with multiple genes on it. And so, right, if you think of a chromosome, each chromosome has multiple genes laid out in it. And each recipe and each recipe in that cookbook is like a gene. Now, let's say that one of my friends wants my recipe for brownies. And so I go to my cookbook and I copy down my recipe for my brownies, right? So I'm reading the information in my cookbook and I'm transcribing it and writing it down on a separate piece of paper. And so that new recipe that I've copied, that's going to be like our RNA. Right, so here's our RNA copy of one of the genes that's in this cookbook. Now, I give that recipe to my friend, and that recipe has information in it which tells my friend what ingredients to add and in what amounts. And so the ingredients in this analogy, those are our amino acids, right? We're going to read the mRNA, and the mRNA is going to tell us what amino acids to put in. And so we put in the amino acids by looking at the recipe and, the, and what we get is our final product, which is our proteins. Now, if you think about it, let's say that I made a mistake. And when I was transcribing my recipe, instead of writing, uh, let's say, one tablespoon of uh, baking soda, instead of saying one tablespoon, maybe I make a mistake and I write one cup. Now, for any of you that have cooked, you know that most recipes for baking don't require much baking soda. So if I write it down incorrectly, right, if I make an error, my friend is going to read the recipe, right, so it's like reading the mRNA, and she's going to put in the wrong amino acids, right? She's going to put in too much baking soda. And so if you think about it, is that going to affect the taste of her brownies? Absolutely. Right? Her proteins are not going to come out properly because she, had the, because she had the wrong information to put in the wrong amounts of amino acids. And so that we're going to talk about in one of the later lectures when we talk about mutations. Okay, but So this is just another analogy to kind of describe the flow of information in a cell. Now, the words of the DNA language are triplet bases that are called codons. And the codons in a gene specify the amino acid sequence of a polypeptide. 
So remember that we said that if we do DNA replication, in DNA replication, if we look at a strand of DNA, both strands in replication serve as the template. In transcription, both strands do not serve as the template. Only one strand is the template. And so this particular strand, this is our template strand. The other strand, okay, the strand down beneath it, is not the template strand, but is instead what we call the coding strand. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay, so you have one strand that's going to be your template, one strand that's going to be your coding strand. So um, when we go to do transcription, transcription we're going to remember transcribe from DNA into mRNA. And so an enzyme called RNA polymerase, RNA polymerase polymerizes or synthesizes RNA, and it's going to read our template, right? So it's going to read an A, and it's going to make a U. Now, notice it's not a T. And remember that that's because RNA doesn't use thymine. Instead, it uses uracil. And so the enzyme's going to read the A. It's going to put in a U. It's going to read the C. It's going to put in the G. It's going to read the C. It's going to put in the G. And so on down the, down the strand. Now, if you notice, if you look at this mRNA, and you look at this strand here, you look at this strand here, which we call the coding strand, notice what you see when you look at those two strands. What do you notice that they have in common? And if you think about it, right, notice that this is the exact same sequence as the coding strand, except anywhere there's a T, there's now a U, right? T, G, G, this is now U, G, G. And there's three T's, there's three U's. And so this is the coding strand. It's the same sequence as what is coding, which is the mRNA. Now, why is it three nucleotides per codon? Remember that we said that there are 20 amino acids. So if you think about it, if it was only one nucleotide per codon, meaning A gave you one amino acid, T gave you another, G gave you another, and C gave you another, four bases to the first power, meaning that every first power, meaning that every nucleotide gets its own codon, there would only be four possible amino acids. But we know that's not true, right? We know that there are 20. If it were two nucleotides per codon, like AA gives us one thing, AT gives us another, four to the second, or 16 amino acids would be possible. But again, there are 20. If it was three nucleotides per codon, four to the third power, 64 amino acids. And so that is enough coverage to give us all 20 amino acids. And so in a minute, we'll talk about why there are 64 possible amino acids, but there are only actually 20. And so what you should look at now is that if you look at these codons, these groups of three nucleotides, those are going to code for a particular amino acid. That's translation, right? We're going to translate. We're going to go from mRNA language and translate image and translate into amino acid language. And so these codons will be read and the appropriate amino acid will be brought in. Now, this diagram here on the right is the genetic code. It's basically a readout of the codons on the mRNA and what amino acid they code for. The code, the genetic code, was determined in the 1960s, and a group of scientists started out using a um, translation machinery in a uh, test tube. And so they mixed a UUUU, so this long poly U sequence, this UUU mRNA, and they mix it with all the components for translation. So they give it the ribosome and they give it amino acids. And what they found was that if they did this, if they mix this mRNA with all of the translation machinery, what they got was a sequence, an amino acid sequence. Notice that UUU codes for, phen codes for phenylalanine. And so when they did this, they got an amino acid sequence that was repeating phenylalanine, phenylalanine, phenylalanine over and over again. And so that told them that UUU codes for phenylalanine.
And so they kept doing this with many, many different sequences until they were able to determine the genetic code. Now, if you look at this, the way that you read this over here on the left, first mRNA base. So let's say we started with the sequence. Let's say our codon was CGG. Okay, so let's say we're trying to look for CGG. So here's C, second base is here, G, G. So CGG would give us arginine. Now, if you look at this genetic code, there's a couple features about it that will become apparent. And the first is, notice that there's one in green, green, AUG. AUG is what we call a start codon, meaning that that's where translation is going to begin. And you also notice it also says MET or start. MET is for um, the amino acid methionine. So if you're looking at the mRNA, the first AUG, that AUG is going to serve as the start of translation. And it's also going to bring with it the first amino acid, which is going to be methionine. So all proteins initially begin with the amino acid methionine. Now, any subsequent AUG is not going to serve as a start codon. It's instead going to just be another methionine amino acid. The other important thing to notice is notice that there are three that are in red, and those three that are in red say stop. We call those our stop codons. Those are going to signal the those are going to signal the end of translation, and we're going to stop making the protein at that point. Now, I'm not going to expect you to memorize these three stop codons. And in fact, you won't be asked to memorize any of the genetic code. If I ask questions related to this, I will in fact give you the genetic code. So if you look at this, there's a few other features that we need to refer to. And the first is that the genetic code shows something called redundancy. And that is that multiple codons can give you the same amino acid. Notice here, for example, C, U, and any third nucleotide gives you leucine. U, U, A, or G also gives you leucine, right? And so multiple codons can give you the same amino acid. So because of that, we say that the genetic code is redundant. Multiple codons are gonna give us the same, the same amino acid. And so remember, there are 64 possible amino acids but there are only 20 actual amino acids, and that's because the genetic code is redundant. The other thing about the genetic code is that the genetic code is unambiguous, meaning that any codon for one amino acid never codes for another amino acid. So it's unambiguous. It always will give you the same amino acid, like UUU will always give you phenylalanine. Another feature of the genetic code is that it doesn't contain spacers or punctuation, meaning that codons are directly next to one another with no gaps in between. And then lastly, the genetic code is nearly universal, meaning that the same genetic code is used for bacteria, for humans, mice, worms. Okay? And so this code, this genetic code, is universal across many, many organisms. So here's just an example showing you that in fact the genetic code is um, universal. Uh, these mice here, these ones that are green, they're actually glowing green and they have a gene for jellyfish in them. And this gene that jellyfish has is called GFP, which stands for green fluorescent protein. And in jellyfish, they can make this GFP protein and they fluoresce green. And so what these scientists did was they took the gene for GFP, this jellyfish, jellyfish gene, and they put it into mice, and you can see that the mice glow green, meaning that the mice were able to take that jellyfish gene and make the GFP jellyfish protein. And so this is just an example to demonstrate that the genetic code is nearly universal, that you can take a gene from one organism and put it into another, and it's gonna make the right protein. This little mouse here, this is a mouse that doesn't have the GFP gene, and you can see he's not glowing green. So this shows you that this is in fact due to the fact that they have this um, other animal gene.
So this is an example and this is going to help you with lab. Okay. So in a minute, you're going to go ahead and pause and I want you to work on this and see if you can go through this. And so what I gave you is I gave you the coding DNA strand. Okay. And so you need to go in and fill out what would the other DNA strand be? So like, what would the complementary DNA strand look like? What would the mRNA codon look like? What would the protein sequence looks like? And when looking for the mRNA, keep in mind about what you need to look for to start making your protein. So keep that in mind when you're trying to determine your protein sequence. What does it need to start with? And so go ahead, take a minute, pause, and then you're going to go through and answer this. So let's go over the answers. So notice that the top one is the coding strand. And so what that means is that this other DNA strand is going to be the template. So if we have G on our complementary DNA strand, G is going to pair with C. A is going to pair with T. T is going to pair with A. G is going to pair with C. C pairs with G, T pairs with A, A pairs with T, C pairs with G, C pairs with G, and T pairs with A. So that is our double-stranded DNA. Now, when we go to fill in the codons, the mRNA, remember that which strand do you need to read and put in the complementary bases? And the answer is, is that if row A is the coding DNA, again, that means row B is the template DNA. It's the template DNA that gets read. So when we see C, RNA polymerase is going to read that and it's going to put in G. Then it's going to come along and it's going to see T and it's going to put in A. Then it sees A it's not going to put T because mRNA does not have T. So instead, A is going to pair with U. C is going to pair with G. G is going to pair with C. A is going to pair with U. T is going to pair with A. G is going to pair with C. G is going to pair with C. And A is going to pair with U. So the next part involves getting the protein sequence. And so what we need to do is we need to look at our mRNA codons and start by looking for the start codon. Notice that the start codon is AUG. So we look for the first AUG and that's gonna put in methionine. And so if we look, here is AUG. So that is gonna put in the amino acid methionine. So it's grouped by three. So AUG is methionine. The next codon is going to be CUA. So we need to look on our um, chart here. So here's C, U, and A. That's going to give us leucine. So that is going to give us leucine. And then our next codon is going to be C, C, U. So we go C, C, U, and that's going to give us proline. And so this is how protein synthesis works. The DNA acts as the blueprint. It has the genetic information. The mRNA is going to be synthesized based on the DNA sequence. And then the protein is going to be made based on the mRNA sequence. And so this is just an overview of protein synthesis. Now, we didn't include this on the chart, but we could include what are called tRNA anticodons tRNAs are going to be complementary to the mRNA. So if the mRNA is AUG, the tRNA is going to be UAC. And so the tRNA anticodon is going to be complementary to the mRNA. Now notice one thing about your mRNA. The original strand that was given to you was the coding DNA. The reason it's called the coding DNA is because its sequence is just like that of the mRNA. The only difference is, is that the mRNA is going to have U anywhere that was T. 
And so the mRNA is gonna be the same as the coding strand. And so now we're gonna talk about how transcription occurs. How do we go from DNA to RNA? Now, the first thing to consider is where does transcription and translation occur in the cell? And if you remember back to when we talked about prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells, prokaryotic cells like bacteria, remember, lack a nucleus. So in prokaryotic cells like bacteria, the DNA is not contained in a membrane-bound nucleus. Instead, it's in the cytoplasm. And so in this case, transcription and translation are coupled. They're not spatially separated. And so as bacteria is doing transcription, so as it's making its mRNA, simultaneously it's gonna translate it. Okay, it's gonna read the mRNA and synthesize the appropriate um, amino acid sequence. And so these two things can happen at the same time. In eukaryotic cells, for example, like ourselves, remember that eukaryotic cells have a nucleus. And the nucleus is made up of a nuclear envelope, so it's a membrane-bound structure. And inside the nucleus is the DNA, right? And so the DNA is in the nucleus, but the ribosome, which does translation, is actually in the cytoplasm. And so you'll notice transcription and translation are spatially separated. In eukaryotic cells, transcription happens in the nucleus because that's where the DNA is. But translation occurs in the cytoplasm because that's where the ribosome is. And the ribosome, remember, is our organelle responsible for protein synthesis. And so what this allows then is that RNA is actually processed before it leaves the nuclear pore. And so we'll talk more about RNA processing in the next lecture. So when talking about transcription, there are three stages. And when we get to translation, you'll notice there are the same three stages. We have initiation, elongation, and termination. And it's kind of nice because the names of the stages actually tell you what they do, right? So the first stage is going to be our initiation. And this is where transcription is initiated or basically begins. And so in initiation, if you look at a gene, at the beginning of a gene is a sequence called the promoter. And a promoter is a very specific DNA sequence that the enzyme RNA polymerase, RNA polymerase is going to polymerize or make the mRNA. And so RNA polymerase is gonna bind to that DNA at the promoter. And once it binds, it's going to initiate transcription. Okay, and so initiation involves RNA polymerase binding to the promoter to begin transcription. Now, remember that when you look at a DNA, only one strand is gonna serve as the template. The other strand is the coding strand. And so in this particular example, this is our template strand. Notice here's three, here's five, which means on the mRNA, this is five, this is three. And just like DNA polymerase, RNA polymerase only goes five prime to three prime. Okay, it has to add on to the three prime end. And so RNA polymerase is gonna separate the two strands of DNA, and we're gonna to start to do elongation. It's going to read the DNA sequence, and it's gonna put in the appropriate mRNA. Okay, so it's gonna do complementary base pairing. And so it's gonna read the DNA, and it's gonna synthesize its mRNA. That's the elongation phase. Termination is where we're gonna terminate. Right? That's when a transcription ends, and we'll talk about why in just a minute. So a little bit more about initiation. If you look in the promoter of a eukaryotic cell, remember that the promoter is where RNA polymerase binds to initiate or turn on transcription. And in the promoter is a sequence called a Tata box. Okay, T-A-T-A, -T -A, we call it a Tata box. And a Tata box, notice the sequence T-A-T-A, -T -A, and then there's a couple more A's in there. This Tata box allows um, proteins called transcription factors to bind. And so transcription factors are basically just DNA binding proteins that recognize certain sequences and they, in some instances, help recruit RNA polymerase to the promoter, meaning that they help RNA polymerase bind to the promoter so that it can initiate transcription.
And so these proteins help bring RNA polymerase to the promoter and they help initiate transcription. And so this is gonna form something called the transcription initiation complex. Okay, it's this group of proteins that helps RNA polymerase bind to begin transcription. And so again, we're gonna do elongation. RNA polymerase is gonna separate the two strands of DNA. It's gonna read the template and it's gonna put in the appropriate nucleotide complementary base pair, right? So if it's a T, it's gonna put in an A. If it's a T, it's gonna put in an A. If it's A, it's gonna put in a U and so on. And so the new mRNA is gonna be made by adding on at the three prime end free RNA nucleotides. This is gonna continue until RNA polymerase reaches a sequence called the terminator. And when it reaches that terminator, it's gonna terminate or finish basically transcription. And RNA polymerase at the sequence is, is then gonna fall off and transcription is complete. And so those are the steps in transcription. So this slide is just summarizing what we just talked about for the stages of transcription. It puts it all in one place. And so again, the three stages of transcription will be initiation, elongation, and termination. And so what's going to happen in initiation, what's going to begin transcription, is that RNA polymerase is going to bind to a site on the DNA that is referred to as the promoter. The promoter is the sequence on the DNA where RNA polymerase will bind to promote or to begin transcription. And so when RNA polymerase binds to the promoter, it's going to unwind the DNA and it's now going to get ready to synthesize a complementary mRNA to the DNA sequence. And so what's going to happen is once this DNA separates, then the RNA is going to be synthesized and it's again going to be complementary to the template strand of the DNA. And so this turquoise color is the RNA, the purple is the DNA. And so notice for the RNA, it's going to be made complementary to the template sequence. So if this is a A in the template DNA, it's gonna put a U and then it's gonna move along and it's gonna read a T on the DNA and it's gonna pair it with an A. So this part is the elongation. RNA polymerase is going to move along the DNA strand, adding the complementary nucleotide to the DNA sequence. And that's going to make the messenger RNA. That process, that elongation is going to occur until RNA polymerase gets to a sequence called the terminator. And so what happens in termination is that when RNA polymerase gets to the sequence, it's going to fall off of the DNA and now transcription is complete. Now we have our complete mRNA and now RNA polymerase is ready to go find another promoter and to initiate transcription again. And so this is just a summary of the stages in transcription. So here is a question, and again, you should pause it, think about it, and then answer. And the question says, transcription, is it red, occurs on the ribosome, yellow is the final process in the assembly of a protein, green is the synthesis of RNA from a DNA template, blue is catalyzed by DNA polymerase, Purple occurs in the cytoplasm of eukaryotic cells. And now what I want you to do when thinking about this as well is not only find the right answer, but also convince yourself why the other answers are wrong. Okay, so go ahead, pause the video, and then when you're ready, replay it, turn it back on again, and listen for the answer. So go ahead, pause the video. So if you said green, you are correct. Transcription is the synthesis of RNA from a DNA template. Now let's go through why the other answers are not right. Transcription occurs on the ribosome. That's not true because translation is gonna occur at the ribosome. Transcription, if you're talking about eukaryotic cell, transcription takes place in the nucleus. Whereas in bacteria, transcription takes place in the cytoplasm, but it doesn't occur on the ribosome. It's not yellow, it's the final process in the assembly of a protein because this happens before the protein is even being produced. It's not blue, it's catalyzed by DNA polymerase. 
because DNA polymerase makes DNA. RNA polymerase is going to be the one responsible for our transcription. RNA polymerase is going to make RNA. And then it's not purple, occurs in the cytoplasm of eukaryotic cells. Now, if I hadn't said eukaryotic cells, transcription could occur in the cytoplasm, right? Prokaryotic cells, transcription occurs in the cytoplasm. But in eukaryotic cells, transcription occurs in the nucleus. And so that is why purple is incorrect. And so I have a question for you. And once I read it, go ahead and pause it. Think of your answer. And then when you're ready, go ahead and push play again. And so the question says, an organism's genetic information is stored within the sequence of blank. This information is transcribed into a sequence of blank, which are then translated into a sequence of blank. Is it red, DNA bases, amino acids, RNA bases, yellow, RNA bases, DNA bases, amino acids, green, amino acids, DNA bases, RNA bases, or blue, DNA bases, RNA bases, amino acids. So go ahead and pause, okay? Now, did you say that the answer is blue? If you did, then you're correct, okay? And so the information is stored within DNA, which is transcribed into RNA bases, which is then translated into amino acids. And so this blue is the correct answer. Now, remember that we said that for eukaryotic cells, organisms that have a nucleus, transcription and translation are spatially separated. Um, in the nucleus, remember, in eukaryotic cells, that's where you're gonna find the DNA, and that in the cytoplasm is where translation is going to occur. And we mentioned that because they're spatially separated, RNA actually undergoes processing before it exits the nucleus. And so what does that really involve? Um, one of the things that happens during RNA processing is that a five prime cap is added and a three prime tail is added. And the cap and tail serve a variety of functions. Um, they help with the stability of the mRNA. Uh, they also help with starting and initiating translation. And another sequence that you should be familiar with is that if you look here on the DNA, here's the exon, here's the intron. Now what are those? Exons are the express sequences. These are the ones that actually code for the protein. Introns, on the other hand, these are called the intervening sequences. These are the sequences that need to be cut out and they do not code for the protein. And so when you look at the DNA, you're gonna see exon, intron, exon, intron, down, down the gene. During transcription, RNA polymerase is gonna read the entire DNA. It's gonna transcribe both the exons and the introns. And so it's gonna make this uh, primary transcript. And again, the primary transcript is gonna have both the exons and the introns. But the RNA needs to be processed. And so it does something called splicing. And splicing is going to remove the introns. And so a structure called the spliceosome is gonna come in it's gonna recognize these junctions between the exons and the introns, and it's gonna loop out the intron and put the exons back together. And so now you get your mature mRNA, and your mature mRNA has all the coding sequences directly next to one another. We have now removed all of the introns. And now that mRNA is ready to exit out the nuclear pore and go into the cytoplasm to do translation. And so we're gonna talk about how uh, we go from RNA to protein. So in order to understand translation, we need to talk about another type of RNA. And this type of RNA is called a transfer RNA. And a transfer RNA acts as the interpreter. It's the one that's gonna read the mRNA language, it's gonna read the codon, and it's gonna bring with it the appropriate amino acid. If you look at the structure, here's the structure of a tRNA, and you'll notice that it has something called an anticodon. And what is an anticodon? So let's write something out real quick. So let's say that my DNA sequence is gonna be A, uh, let's say A, T, C. Okay, so this is just some made up DNA sequence. Let's say that my DNA sequence is A, T, C. And let's say that this um, DNA is 
is going to be my template strand. If this is my template strand, that means that my mRNA is going to be complementary. So A is going to pair with U, T is going to pair with A, C is going to pair with G. So this is my mRNA, and that mRNA is going to be your codon. Now, if you look at the tRNA, this means that the tRNA anticodon is going to be complementary complementary to the mRNA codon. So if this is a T, or I'm sorry, if this is a U on tRNA, it's going to be an A. And if on mRNA it's an A, it's going to be a U. And if on mRNA it's going to be a C, the tRNA is going to have, or I'm sorry, if the mRNA has a G, tRNA is going to have a U. And so the anticodon is on the tRNA, and the anticodon is going to be complementary to the mRNA codon. Okay, and so notice U is going to have A, A is going to have U, G is going to have C. And so this is the way that the tRNA is going to act as the interpreter. It's going to read the mRNA codon, and it has another important site that's called the amino acid attachment site. And this is where the amino acid will bind to. And so in this way, the tRNA is able to bring in the appropriate amino acid based on its anticodon, which recognizes a very specific, specific codon on the mRNA. Now, remember that when we talked about cell organ organelles, we mentioned that the ribosome is responsible for protein synthesis. And so the ribosome is going to be responsible for translation. Remember back to when we talked about the ribosome, it has two subunits, a small subunit and a large subunit, and each subunit is made up of ribosomal RNA and proteins. And so remember we talked about that the nucleolus, the nucleolus did ribosomal RNA synthesis, and it was also responsible for um, ribosome assembly. And so remember that the ribosomal RNA made the nucleolus, the proteins are gonna come into the nucleus, Ribosomal RNA is going to get put together in the nucleolus with them, and it's going to make our large and our small subunits. And the large and the small subunits don't come together until translation. And so the nucleolus is only responsible for synthesizing or um, putting together, assembling um, the large subunit, and it's also responsible for assembling the small subunit. But it doesn't put them both together um, until translation. The large and small subunit will come together in the cytoplasm. Now, an important feature of the ribosome is that it has binding sites for both mRNAs and tRNA. And so you can see that it's going to bind the mRNA, and it also is going to be able to bind the tRNA to bring the anticodon with the codon. And notice here you can see that this has two tRNAs bound together side by side. And we'll talk about how translation works and how we can add on um, an amino acid to a growing polypeptide chain. So just like transcription, uh, translation has three steps, initiation, elongation, termination. So the same three steps that transcription has. So let's start by going through what happens in each step. So in initiation, the first thing that's going to happen is that the mRNA binds to a small ribosomal subunit. Okay, so here we see here's our mRNA, here is our small ribosomal subunit, and the small subunit is going to bind to the uh, of mRNA. Now, remember that when we do translation, translation always starts, the start codon is AUG. And so notice that this sequence here, this we call the UTR. UTR stands for untranslated region. Notice there's no AUG. So translation doesn't begin until the first AUG. And that first AUG is going to be bound by a tRNA that has a sequence of UAC, right? It's going to be complementary to the AUG. And it's going to bring with it the amino acid methionine. Remember that all proteins initially We'll start with methionine as the first amino acid. And so once that tRNA docks at the mRNA, now the large ribosomal subunit will come in. It's going to bind to the small subunit, 
and now we have initiated translation. We have our functional ribosome, and now we're ready to translate um, the mRNA sequence. Elongation, right, is gonna be where we elongate or grow our polypeptide chain. And so what's gonna happen is, is remember that we said that for this uh, ribosome, that there are two spots where the tRNAs can bind. And so the next tRNA is gonna come in and it's gonna recognize the next codon. And so notice that your next codon here is GGA. And so a tRNA that's complementary that has CCU is gonna come in and bind. Now, the important thing that's gonna happen then is when these are coming together on the ribosome, those ribosomal RNAs are actually catalytic. They're able to catalyze or speed up the peptide bond between methionine and the next amino acid, so in this case, glycine. And so it's gonna form that peptide bond between those two amino acids. Methionine is gonna leave its tRNA and it's now going to be on the glycine. That tRNA is now gonna leave and then the glycine is going to shift, okay? And so the ribosome is like a ratchet. It's now gonna shift down to the right, so it's gonna go this way. That tRNA is gonna leave, so here you can see the tRNA leave. And then now there's a new spot er, that can be occupied by the next tRNA. And so that next tRNA comes in, it's gonna catalyze the peptide bond between these amino acids. Once it does that, the chain is now gonna be over here this tRNA is gonna leave, and the next one's gonna go, come in here. And so this is the elongation. This is gonna be growing and lengthening that polypeptide chain. And then termination happens when we get to a stop codon. And so when you get to a stop codon, remember that there are three of them, um, the stop codons don't have a tRNA that's going to bind. Instead, they have a protein called the release factor protein. And this release factor protein is going to recognize the stop codon. It's gonna bind, and because there's no amino acid to be brought with it, that's gonna signal the end of translation. And so once we get this release factor and there's nowhere to add on to the polypeptide chain, now the ribosomal subunits are gonna dissociate, they're gonna come apart, and your polypeptide is now released and is fully formed. So how fast does translation occur? And the answer to that is that when we do translation, it's not that just one ribosome is gonna bind at the beginning of the mRNA, and it's gonna go all the way through, and then it's gonna come back and do it again and again. Instead, many ribosomes bind along the length of an mRNA, and they form something called the polyribosome structure. And so here's an electron micrograph. You can actually see this. Um, so here you have your mRNA. And all of these little like dots, those are gonna be your ribosomes. And so you can see that there's many, many ribosomes along the length of an mRNA. And so because of this, um, because they're gonna just kind of move along the mRNA, this is going to allow translation to be very, very fast. Um, e. coli, which is a common bacteria that can be found in your gut, E. coli can string 40 amino acids per second. So an average size protein of 400 amino acids is built in just 10 seconds. Another example that really shows you how fast this is, is that a human immune cell, so your B cells, can manufacture 2,000 identical antibody proteins per second. So just think about that for a minute, how fast that is. It's like, boom, it just made 2,000 antibody proteins. So the translation is very, very, very rapid. And the reason that your immune system is so efficient is that you have these cells that are called memory cells. And your memory cells recognize um, a foreign invader that they've already seen. And once they see that, they have that information stored so that if you come in contact with that again, your immune system just cranks out antibodies to fight off that foreign invader. And so this is why you can't get sick with the same thing again and again. Um, for example, right, if you've ever had the chicken pox, you know that once you have the chicken pox, you're not gonna get it again. Um, but if you think about the flu, right, you've probably had a flu many, many times.
And that's because what ends up happening is, is the flu virus actually can mutate and it changes its shape. It's like a chameleon. It changes its shape. And so the antibodies that normally would recognize it because its structure is a little bit different, it now, those antibodies won't recognize it and the flu is kind of just hiding out and your body has to figure out new antibodies to produce. And so it's just something to kind of think about, about how amazing your bodies actually are. In prokaryotic cells, remember that there is not spatial separation of the DNA and the proteins being made, right? In prokaryotic cells, they don't have a membrane-bound nucleus. And so transcription and translation occur simultaneously, meaning as soon as that mRNA gets produced, that mRNA is going to be read and it's going to produce the protein. And again, that's because there is no spatial separation of transcription and translation. And so you can see this here looking at this example. The purple is the DNA. This is RNA polymerase reading the DNA. It's synthesizing the mRNA. The mRNA is the turquoise color. And notice that right as the mRNA is, is made, the ribosome is going to attach and it's going to start to translate it and make the polypeptide chain. And so this is going to be something that is unique in prokaryotic cells because they lack that spatial separation. So we talked about in our organelles lecture that for proteins that are going to be secreted, that um, proteins that are going to be secreted will be made by bound ribosomes. Now all ribosomes start out as free ribosomes and they're going to be found in the cytoplasm. And so we said that during translation, that when we initiate translation, that the large and the small subunits are going to come together. And so when we start translation, the large subunit is going to be reading the mRNA and it's going to make its amino acid chain. Now, if a protein is destined to become secreted, it has a sequence of amino acids at the beginning of the sequence that is what we call the signal peptide. And that signal peptide tells the cell where that protein is going to go. So what's going to happen then is that an SRP, the signal recognition particle, the SRP is going to recognize that signal peptide and it's going to bind. And when it binds, it allows this ribosome to then dock onto the endoplasmic reticulum. And this SRP is going to bind to an SRP uh, receptor protein. And that's gonna allow the uh, ribosome to dock onto the endoplasmic reticulum. And then the endoplasmic reticulum, the protein is going to be um, synthesized into the endoplasmic reticulum. The signal peptide is gonna be cut off, it's gonna be removed. And then your protein is going to be made inside the lumen of the ER. And so remember, I said that all proteins are going to start with methionine as the first amino acid, but they might not all end up with methionine as the first amino acid because it might be cut off by the endoplasmic reticulum. So the next question for you is, the RNA that is translated into a polypeptide is blank RNA. Is it red, nuclear? yellow ribosomal, green transfer, or blue messenger. So go ahead, pause your video when you're ready, push play to hear the answer. So if you said blue messenger RNA, you would be correct. It's the mRNA that gets translated into the polypeptide. And so transfer RNA, transfer RNA is gonna serve as the translator. It's gonna be able to read the mRNA and bring in the appropriate amino acid. Ribosomal RNA is a type of RNA that is gonna be used in the ribosome, but it's not what's gonna be translated. So it's blue messenger RNA. This student is cramming for her biology test with only a frosting covered donut for lunch. Specialized cells in her pancreas respond to the increasing amount of sugar in her blood by releasing insulin a small protein that regulates blood sugar levels. Let's go inside one of these cells to see how this protein is manufactured. The instructions for making insulin are coded by a segment of DNA in the nucleus. In transcription, 
An enzyme zips along the DNA, forming RNA, shown here in red. RNA nucleotides line up with their complementary DNA partners, transcribing the information in DNA into RNA. As the RNA grows, it is processed in several ways. First, a modified guanine nucleotide is added to the beginning as a cap. Also, segments of the RNA strand that do not actually code for the protein are removed and the remaining segments of RNA are reconnected. Finally, extra adenine nucleotides are added to the end of the RNA strand, forming a tail. The completed messenger RNA, mRNA, now leaves the nucleus. The message in mRNA is translated into a protein in the cytoplasm. First, a transfer RNA, tRNA, arrives, carrying a specific amino acid. The small subunit of a ribosome attaches to the mRNA. Now, the larger subunit of the ribosome attaches. A second tRNA docks, bringing another amino acid. The ribosome helps to form a covalent bond between the two amino acids. The mRNA shifts and the first tRNA leaves. A new tRNA brings another amino acid. The ribosome helps to form a new bond and the process is repeated. Notice that one end of a tRNA molecule has a set of three bases called an anticodon that pairs with complementary bases on the mRNA. The other end of the tRNA carries a specific amino acid. Different types of tRNAs carry different amino acids. In this way, the message in mRNA is translated into a specific sequence of amino acids. For proteins that will be secreted from the cell, like insulin, the ribosome docks on the rough ER and the protein grows into the ER compartment. The new protein molecules are packaged in a vesicle that is transported to the Golgi apparatus, where many proteins are processed. However, insulin is packaged in a vesicle that leaves the Golgi and is then processed. Proteins secreted from the cell are shipped to the plasma membrane. Here, insulin is secreted from the pancreas and begins to regulate the student's rising blood sugar levels. So we're going to start to talk about regulation of transcription in prokaryotes. So before we can do that, though, we need to talk about different types of genes. If we call a gene constitutive, a constitutive gene is a gene that is always expressed, meaning that it's always turned on. And that gene is going to produce some sort of essential protein, just like a gene for an enzyme in glycolysis. That is essential. The cells need that. It's always expressed. It's always turned on because the cell is going to require that. Adaptive genes, on the other hand, are genes that are expressed only as needed. It's a way for the cell to conserve energy. And what I mean by that is if we build a protein, if we make a protein, that requires the investment of energy. The cell is not going to want to invest to produce a protein, an enzyme, if it's not needed. And so in that case, those types of genes would be referred to as an adaptive gene. They're only turned on when needed. So for example, if we were talking about bacteria, Bacteria can metabolize lactose. Lactose is a disaccharide. Now, if glucose is available, bacteria will preferentially choose to use glucose. It's a monosaccharide. It's easier for them to digest. However, if glucose is not available, but lactose is, then bacteria can turn on expression of genes that are needed to metabolize the lactose but they only do that under certain conditions. They only do it when lactose is present and glucose is not, because if glucose is present, they don't need to make enzymes to metabolize the lactose. So we are gonna look at two categories of adaptive genes. We have what are referred to as inducible genes, meaning that those genes by default are off, but they can be induced to be turned on. 
or we have repressible genes who default is on and they have to have some signal that causes the genes to become repressed. So we call these our repressible genes because their default is on, a signal has to be present to then turn those genes off. So let's start by talking about our inducible genes. Again, these are part of our adaptive genes, meaning that they are controlled, they're not on all the time. In an inducible gene, they are influenced by the substrate concentration, meaning the substrate concentration is going to influence if that gene expression is turned on. Now, why do we even have these types of genes? Well, because simply it's used to conserve energy. We don't wanna make those enzymes, those proteins, if they're not needed by the cell. Default position of an inducible gene is going to be off. So again, if we call it inducible, it has to be induced to turn on expression. By default, it is going to be off. An example would be the lactose operon, or what you'll often hear called the LAC operon. The goal of the LAC operon is to produce enzymes to break down lactose only when lactose is present. So again, if lactose is not present, we don't want to make enzymes to metabolize lactose. And so that is what the LAC operon is going to do. So in bacteria, we have what are referred to as operons. And these are the transcriptional units in bacteria. They are a cluster of functionally related genes that can be under the coordinated control of a single on-off switch. The on-off switch, that regulatory switch, is a segment of DNA called an operator. And the operator is usually a sequence that's within the promoter. Now you might recall that when we talked about transcription that the promoter is where transcription is initiated meaning that normally to initiate transcription, RNA polymerase is going to bind to the promoter and that will allow transcription to be turned on. Within the promoter in bacteria, there are these operator sequences. These are the on-off switch. They will control if gene expression is turned on or off and you will see this in just a minute. The operon is the entire stretch of DNA that includes the operator, the promoter, and the genes that they control. So again, here we go. You can see our promoter, our operator, and the genes that they control. And so we're gonna look at how does this system work. E. coli is a type of bacteria that's normally found in your gut. Everybody has it as part of your gut, as part of your normal flora. Now, E. coli can metabolize lactose in the absence of glucose. So again, if glucose is present, E. coli is going to choose to use glucose as its first choice for food because glucose is a monosaccharide. However, if glucose is absent and lactose is present, E. coli can then metabolize the lactose. However, it requires expressions of genes to do this. And these genes are only expressed when lactose is around. So again, by default, these genes will be off but if lactose, which is the substrate in this case, if lactose is present, expression of these genes is going to be turned on so that the bacteria can metabolize that lactose. So let's talk about how bacteria can metabolize lactose. Lactose being a sugar is polar, right? If you think about if you take sucrose, which is table sugar, and you put that in your coffee, it is going to dissolve because sucrose is polar, lactose is also polar. So what that means is that it can't cross the cell membrane on its own. It needs the assistance of a channel protein in order to get lactose into the cell. The name of this channel protein is called galactoside permease. So permease means to permeate or to get in. It's what's going to allow lactose to get into the cell. So you have to have expression of that galactoside permease in order to get lactose into the cell. The cell has to produce that channel protein to get lactose in. Lactose metabolism also requires an enzyme called beta-galactosidase. Beta-galactosidase is just basically the fancy name for bacterial lactase. Remember that lactase is the enzyme that breaks down lactose. Whenever you see ACE, you should think enzyme. So the name of lactase in bacteria, it has a specific name, it's called beta-galactosidase. And this enzyme is going to catalyze 
the hydrolysis of lactose, basically meaning that it's going to break apart the disaccharide. When it breaks apart the disaccharide, it's going to produce galactose plus glucose. And so it's going to break down the lactose, the disaccharide, into its monosaccharides, the galactose and the glucose. Now, when it breaks it down to galactose and glucose, E. coli can then use the glucose for glycolysis, and then they will convert the galactose to glucose, which can be used in glycolysis. And so this is the bacteria's way to be able to metabolize the lactose for food if glucose is not available. But again, notice that in order to do so, it requires that bacteria turn on expression of these genes, the genes that control the galactoside permease and the beta galactosidase. Those genes have to be turned on the cell needs to produce those enzymes, and then they will be able to metabolize the lactose. So if we look at the lac operon, again, we have our promoter, our operator, and the genes that they control. In the lac operon, there are three genes that are controlled by this promoter. We have our lac Z gene. Lac Z gene encodes that beta galactosidase. Remember that that's the enzyme that is used to hydrolyze the lactose. Lac Y encodes that permease. Remember that the permease is the lactose membrane transporter. It's what allows lactose into the cell. And then the lac A encodes what's referred to as a transacetylase. This is used to modify toxic galactosides that can result as a, meta as a product of metabolism of lactose. Now these genes, these required genes are transcribed together as one transcript and they're all under the control of one promoter. So either they are all on, meaning all of those will produce proteins, or they are all off, and it makes sense. Their job is to coordinate in the metabolism of lactose. If lactose is present, we need to turn on expression of all three. We need to have lactose get into the cell. We need to have lactose be metabolized. So we need all three. And so they're all controlled by one promoter. So let's look at how this regulation works. So what we have is that we have our LAC I, and our LAC I is a regulatory gene. The LAC I is what's called the LAC repressor. So this gene is going to be transcribed and make an mRNA. The mRNA is going to produce a protein, and the LAC I gene is constitutive. It's always transcribed, it's always turned on. So in the cell, you always have this active repressor. The active repressor can bind to the operator, and when it binds to the operator, it's going to turn off transcription of the lac operon because now RNA polymerase cannot bind to the promoter and therefore cannot initiate and turn on transcription. And so when this repressor is active, it's gonna to bind to the operator and it turns off transcription. Now, does it turn it off completely? The answer is no, it doesn't turn it off completely because this binding of the repressor to the operator is uh, reversible, meaning it binds and then it comes off and then it binds and it comes off. Sometimes RNA polymerase does get to the promoter and does turn on expression of those genes. And so what you see here is it says basal expression. What that basically means is background levels. It's gonna turn on a little bit of expression and you're gonna see in a minute why you actually need a little bit of these enzymes being produced at all times, but it's at a very, very low level. So in this case, we consider it to be off, right? Default is going to be off. That in the absence of lactose, this gene is gonna be turned off. Now, why is it important that we have the enzymes expressed at background levels? Well, because we need a way for the cell to receive a signal that lactose is present. So what is that signal? Well, when lactose is hydrolyzed, it's going to sometimes get converted by beta galactosidase into allolactose. So the cell is going to take that lactose and sometimes the beta galactosidase, instead of it breaking it into its monosaccharides, instead it's going to convert lactose into allolactose. This occurs at very low levels. So again, it's not gonna occur often, but it does happen. But this is essential for regulation because what you're gonna see in a minute 
is that allolactose acts as the inducer. It's the signal that says lactose is present, turn on expression. Now, in order to even make allolactose, lactose had to be able to get into the cell. So you have to have some background level because without it, you would not have this channel protein. And without that channel protein, lactose can't get in to even make allolactose. And so that's why it's important that there is some background level of expression, there is some basal expression, because you need at least a little bit of the permease and a little bit of the beta-galactosidase to be able to even make the allolactose, which is going to act as the LAC inducer. So allolactose is the LAC operon inducer. And the way that it works is that the allolactose is going to bind to that repressor. When it binds to the repressor, it causes the repressor to change shape. When the repressor changes shape, it now inactivates the repressor. The repressor does not bind to the operator and now RNA polymerase can. So again, the repressor can no longer bind to the operator. So notice it's blocked and when it doesn't bind to the operator, now RNA polymerase does and it turns on transcription. And so in this way, the allolactose acts as the inducer. It is responsible for turning on transcription and it does so again by inactivating the repressor. And so this only happens, however, when lactose is present because the only way that you get allolactose is if lactose is present. And so the allolactose serves as the signal to the cell that says, hey, lactose is present. We need to turn on transcription and we need to make the mRNA for these three genes and then make the proteins for these three genes. And so again, this is what we call an inducible system. Default position is off. So when lactose is not present, this is going to be off. However, when lactose is present, it's going to form allolactose, which serves as the inducer, and it's going to turn on transcription of these genes. So question for you, which of the following does not happen in E. coli when lactose is present and glucose is absent? Red, allolactose binds to the lac repressor and acts as the inducer. Yellow, the lac I gene is transcribed. Green, the lac repressor binds to the operator. Blue, the lac C, lac A, and lac Y genes are transcribed as a single transcript or purple, all of the above occur. So what I want you to do is I want you to pause your video, write down what you think your answer is, and when you're ready, go ahead and push play. We will not go over the answer right now. This will actually be as part of our discussion in our Zoom meetings. So make sure that you have your answers ready to go for these questions. Um, and so this will be the first question. So you can label this question number one and then write the color of your answer and you will discuss with groups what you think your answer is. And so this is your question for LAC operon. So summary of the LAC operon, the, regula the regulator gene codes for a repressor protein. So again, that is your LAC I. The LAC I gene is constitutive, it's always on, which means that the cell is always making the LAC repressor protein. The repressor protein binds to the operator and blocks transcription. That is the default position. However, with excess lactose, right, if lactose is present, that will allow the cell to make allolactose. Allolactose will bind to the repressor protein it changes the binding site on the repressor, meaning it causes the repressor to change shape so that the repressor can no longer bind to the operator and transcription occurs. And so transcription is going to be turned on. Now, when you went through the last question, hopefully you kind of reason your way through it, right? And so what I mean by that is if you think about this, right? If lactose is present and glucose is absent, the first thing you wanna ask yourself is, in this scenario, if lactose is present and glucose is not, is gene expression going to be turned on or off? That's the first thing you wanna ask yourself, is in this situation, if lactose is present and glucose is absent, do we want gene expression turned on or off? 
and then which of those is not accomplished in this question. So you want to kind of reason your way through it when you're trying to answer this question. And so I, when I'm solving this, I would write myself a note, gene expression would be on or gene expression would be off so that I could see which of these would accomplish that goal. So we just talked about inducible genes. Now we are going to talk about repressible genes. So again, in a repressible gene, the default position is going to be on. This can be causing what's called feedback repression. And feedback repression is gonna be mediated by repressors. Again, these are proteins that block transcription and an excess of the end product results in suppression of the genetic apparatus involved in enzyme production. So you might recall back when we talked about feedback inhibition, where a product can feed back and can affect the enzyme at an earlier step in that pathway. And it causes that enzyme to change shape. And when that enzyme is changed shape, it turns off that pathway. This is a little bit different in that we're not just affecting the enzyme itself. We are actually altering the production of that enzyme, not the activity of the enzyme, but whether or not the cell even produces that enzyme. And so this is a way that we can have a product feedback and turn off production of its own enzyme. The default position of a repressible gene, again, is on. This has slow but long-term effects. And an example that we're going to talk about for this one is that the effect of tryptophan concentrations. Tryptophan is an amino acid. So we're looking at the effect of tryptophan concentrations on genes that synthesize the enzymes for tryptophan production. So notice for the LAC operon, that was genes that are used to metabolize or break down lactose. In this case, we're talking about enzymes that are used to make tryptophan. So not break down tryptophan, but instead synthesize tryptophan. So this system is gonna be a little bit different because of that difference in one is breaking down a substrate, this one is allowing you to produce that substrate. So let's look at how feedback repression works. So again, in this type of regulation, gene expression by default is on. So just like in the LAC operon, the tryptophan operon has a regulatory gene. And this regulatory gene is constitutive. It's always produced, meaning that the cell is constantly making that repressor protein. But in this case, the repressor protein on its own is inactive. And what that means is that it cannot bind to the operator. And when it can't bind to the operator, then RNA polymerase can bind to the promoter and transcription is turned on. So when tryptophan levels are low, so notice low concentrations of tryptophan. So when tryptophan concentrations are low, the repressor is inactive. It can't bind to the operator and transcription is turned on. Now that's gonna make mRNA and then it's going to produce proteins for enzymes that are used to synthesize tryptophan. So when the concentration of tryptophan is low, the cell wants to make enzymes to make tryptophan. Makes sense, right? If you don't have enough tryptophan, the cell wants to make tryptophan. How does it do that? It needs to make the enzymes to make the tryptophan. However, if tryptophan levels are high, if tryptophan levels are high, well, the tryptophan itself is going to bind to the repressor protein. So notice again, it's normally inactive, but when tryptophan binds to the repressor, it causes the repressor to change shape and now it binds to the operator. And when it binds to the operator, it turns off transcription and now gene expression is turned off. So in this case, when tryptophan levels are high, this is when we get our feedback repression because if we have enough tryptophan in the cell, we don't need to make enzymes to make more tryptophan. So in this case, the tryptophan itself is going to regulate feedback repression. The product is gonna feed back and it's going to activate the repressor. It's gonna cause the repressor to now bind to the operator and now tryptophan uh, production of enzymes needed to synthesize tryptophan are turned off. So if we have enough tryptophan, then we don't need to make enzymes to synthesize more tryptophan. And the result is that gene expression is now turned off.
And so this is feedback repression. Again, default in this case is on. And when the tryptophan is present, it is going to turn it off. Because again, we don't need to make more tryptophan if the concentration of tryptophan is high enough. Now again, notice the difference between this and the inducible. In the inducible, we were making enzymes to break down the substrate. In this one, the tryptophan is going to feed back to turn off production to make tryptophan. So notice that in this case, we're not breaking down tryptophan, we're actually synthesizing tryptophan. And so tryptophan will feed back and it will turn off production of enzymes needed to make tryptophan. So summary of tryptophan operon. So with low tryptophan levels, the repressor protein cannot bind to the operator. Remember that the repressor would be inactive and transcription occurs. However, when tryptophan levels are high, tryptophan will bind to the repressor to form a complex that now activates the repressor to bind to the operator. And when the repressor binds to the operator, transcription is now blocked. So again, the product high levels of tryptophan will feed back and turn off production of enzymes that are used to make more tryptophan. So that is our feedback repression. So comparing feedback inhibition and feedback repression, they both have where the product is gonna feed back to turn off their own pathway. The way that they do that though is different. In feedback inhibition, it's going to affect the enzymatic activity, what we refer to as allosteric inhibition. The product actually feeds back and it binds to the enzyme and it causes the enzyme to change shape and it inactivates the enzyme that way. This method is very fast acting, but it's also very short lived. Feedback repression, on the other hand, is not inactivating the enzyme itself. It's not affecting those enzymes that are already in the cell that are used to make tryptophan. Instead, it's affecting enzymatic production. Basically, it's regulating if the protein is even produced in the first place. This has a slower response time because it's going to take time for this type of regulation, but the effects are gonna be more enduring, meaning they're longer lasting, because it will take time to turn back on that system. So this is just comparing feedback inhibition and feedback repression. Now notice when you see repression, you should think gene expression. Feedback inhibition is affecting the activity of the enzyme and affecting it that way. So now we're gonna move on and talk about mutations, which are changes in the DNA sequence. So like I suggested, mutations are changes in DNA sequence. And if we refer to a mutation as being a point mutation, that means that it changes the DNA sequence by one or a few nucleotides. We can have what's referred to as a base pair substitution, which is that we don't change the number of nucleotides, we simply swap one letter for another. So instead of an A, a mistake happens and a C gets put in, for example. That would be a base pair substitution. We can also have what are referred to as insertions or deletions. And in an insertion or a deletion, we're changing the number of nucleotides. And these will often produce a frame shift mutation because they regroup the codons of the gene if the insertion or deletion is not a multiple of three. So if I add one, that's gonna change the way the codons are grouped. And you'll see that in a minute. So why do we care about mutations? Well, mutations can lead to disease. An example of this would be sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic condition. And in patients who have sickle cell anemia, they have inherited two mutated copies of this gene. So normally, when you look at hemoglobin, hemoglobin is a protein, and it's made of four subunits. It has two alpha subunits and two beta subunits, beta globin. The mutation for sickle cell anemia happens in the beta globin gene. And so what happens is, is this is the normal hemoglobin sequence. This is part of it. And so we have proline, glutamic acid, glutamic acid. However, people who inherit the sickle cell allele, they have C, and instead of T, notice it's replaced with an A, 
which then changes the mRNA so that this has a U. So now the codon reads GUG instead of GAG. And when that happens, when it was GAG, that's glutamic acid. But when it was mutated and it's GUG, that gives valine. Now, the reason that that's so critical is that they have different properties in terms of their R groups. Glutamic acid is an acidic amino acid. It has ionic properties, whereas valine is hydrophobic. And so what ends up happening is, is that by changing just this one single amino acid, meaning we change one nucleotide in the DNA, which changes just one mRNA, that changes the one amino acid. Yet that one amino acid change is enough to cause hemoglobin protein to misfold. It doesn't fold in its correct conformation. Now, when hemoglobin doesn't fold correctly, what ends up happening is that the hemoglobin molecules get sticky and they start to stick together. Normally, they would be separate in a cell. They would be free in the red blood cell. And these red blood cells have kind of this concave disc shape. However, in sickle cell anemia, when we have these abnormal hemoglobin molecules that stick together, they're gonna form, think of it like if you had a rubber band, right? The red blood cells like the rubber band. If I put a toothpick in the middle, it's gonna elongate and it's gonna stretch that rubber band. When we get these hemoglobins that all stick together, it's gonna cause the red blood cells to elongate and they take on this very classical sickle cell shape. And so these red blood cells have this abnormal shape and they cause a whole host of problems for patients who have this disorder. These blood, vessels, or these blood cells get stuck in blood vessels, like in the capillaries, the little tiny blood vessels. That can lead to damage of tissue, that can lead to pain in the site where these blood vessels get um, stuck. This type of red blood cell does not carry oxygen very efficiently, hence the name sickle cell anemia, because if you don't transport oxygen effectively, then you're not gonna make ATP effectively and you become fatigued and tired. So this one single nucleotide change causes all of these problems for patients who are born with this mutation. And so even a single nucleotide is enough to have a very serious effect. So we're gonna look at some examples of different types of base pair substitutions. So what we have is over here, we have our wild type sequence. And so our protein reads, methionine, lysine, phenylalanine, glycine, and then we get a stop codon. Now, in some cases, we can get what we refer to as a silent mutation. So if we look at this one on the top, there's an A here instead of G, and when we get an A instead of a G, now the mRNA is gonna have a U instead of a C, and that is still gonna code for glycine. This is because the genetic code is redundant. Remember that multiple codons can give us the same amino acid. So it is entirely possible to change a nucleotide and still end up with the same amino acid, meaning that your protein is exactly the same. This is why we call this a silent mutation. It has no effect because the protein sequence is exactly the same. If we call a mutation a missense, Missense means that we change one amino acid. We simply swap one am amino acid from, for another. So in this example here, we have a T instead of a C, which then leads to an A instead of a G, and instead of glycine, we end up with serine. That is a missense. We simply swap one amino acid for another. So in the case of sickle cell anemia, that is also a missense. Right? We are swapping glutamic acid and instead putting in valine. A nonsense mutation is one where you change the amino acid to a stop codon. You get a premature stop codon. And what that means is that you're going to end up with a shortened or truncated protein. Every amino acid after that mutation is now missing. So for example, if we get an A here instead of a T, that is gonna put in a U on the mRNA, and UAG is gonna be a stop codon. 
Notice that that protein is missing lysine, phenylalanine, glycine, etc. If you think about amino acids often being several hundred amino acids long, depending on how soon that stop codon gets put in, let's say the stop codon happens at amino acid number 20, well, you're missing, let's say it's a 400 amino acid protein, you're missing 380 amino acids. Is that protein likely going to function properly? No, it's not, right? Because it's missing most of its amino acids. And so a nonsense mutation can be quite severe because it drastically changes the protein. It ends up with a shortened protein. So here is another way to think about these mutations. So we can think about the letters in the alphabet are like the nucleotides, right? So we have a variety of nucleotides that we could have. And the grouping of the letters, which is the words, the words, right, are going to be our codons. They're going to code for an amino acid. So my wild type, my unmutated sequence, is the big bad dog ate the fat red cat. So notice that they're grouped in three. The letters are grouped in three. The nucleotides are grouped in three. And those codons are going to give us words. So the big bad dog ate the fat red cat. Now, we could get a base pair substitution. So notice that here, instead of an A, we substitute an I. Now, it changes the meaning of the sentence. It says, the big bad dog ate the fit red cat. That is very different from the fat red cat, right? And so this would be an example of a missense mutation. We have swapped one nucleotide for another, and as a result, that codon, right, that amino acid is going to be changed, that word. We could get a nonsense mutation where we get a premature stop codon. Think of it like a period. So it might read now the big bad stop. It's missing all the other amino acids, right? It's missing all the other words in the sentence. We could get mutations that lead to a frame shift. And so the first example here is an insertion. So notice that here we have this B added. And when we have this B added, when we add in one nucleotide, notice that the groupings of the letters is no longer the same because codons are in groups of three. So now the sentence reads, the big bab dod gat et Effa, etc. Notice that everything after that mutation has now changed. So this is going to be a very drastic change in the protein when you get a frame shift because every amino acid after that mutation, every word after that mutation is going to be changed. We could also have a deletion. So notice that in this case, we delete one nucleotide that now reads the big bedid, oga, tet, etc. So again, when we delete one, that is also going to cause a frame shift because we're now regrouping the three for the codons. And so this could be a very dramatic effect as well. So the most dramatic in terms of their effect on the protein sequence would be a nonsense mutation because you're gonna be missing a lot of amino acids and your frame shift mutations. And the frame shifts happen when you insert or delete not a multiple of three. If I simply add in a multiple of three, I'm not gonna cause a frame shift. I might end up with one or two amino acids different depending on where that mutation occurs but I'm not gonna cause a frame shift because when I add in a multiple of three, it's not gonna change the reading frame. So question for you, which type of mutation is most likely to drastically affect a protein sequence? Red, silent mutation. Yellow, missense mutation. Green, insertion of three. Blue, deletion of three. Or purple, insertion of one. Pause your video, think of your answer, and when you're ready, push play. Okay, so hopefully you said purple insertion of one. 
So if we start at the top, silent mutation, does that change the protein sequence? Answer is no. Silent mutation has no effect on the protein sequence. So that's not going to be very great of an effect. Missense mutation, we're going to change one amino acid. Insertion of three, notice that it's a multiple of three, so it's not going to cause a frame shift. And therefore, when we insert three, we will change one or two amino acids at most, depending on where that group of three goes in. Blue, deletion of three nucleotides. Again, it's a multiple of three and therefore will not cause a frame shift. However, purple, insertion of one nucleotide, that's going to drastically affect the protein sequence because when we add one, that is going to lead to a frame shift. Our reading frame is completely different and all the amino acids after that point are now gonna be different. So when we think of mutations, we often think a negative connotation, like mutations are bad. But mutations could be neutral, meaning they don't really have an effect. In some cases, they are actually beneficial. We don't think about them as being beneficial, but in fact, evolution is driven by mutations. Organisms happen to get random mutations and that random mutation leads to some sort of protein and that protein might give the organism an advantage. For example, one that we're gonna talk about in a little bit would be antibiotic resistance in bacteria. That was a random mutation. Bacteria randomly acquired that mutation and by having that mutation, it allowed them to be resistant to antibiotics. So mutations can be beneficial. Camouflage, for example, is another example of a beneficial mutation. Or mutations can be harmful. When we talk about mutations, we can talk about what are called mutagens. Mutagens are agents that cause mutations, meaning they are either chemicals or some physical component that leads to increasing the rate of mutations. Some examples of mutagens, we can have ionizing radiation, UV light, you're not supposed to go out in the sunlight for long periods of time, which I'm sure you're aware, because UV light causes your DNA to do what's called the thymine-thymine dimer. It causes the DNA where there are two T's together. They form this covalent bond between the T's. And when DNA goes to replicate, DNA polymerase sees the thymine-thymine dimer and it goes, I don't know what this is. It doesn't look like thymine. And it puts in any random nucleotide and now you end up with a mutation. And so UV light is a mutagen. It induces mutations, and that's why you need to protect yourself when you go out in the sun. There are chemical mutagens, for example. There are a whole host of them in cigarettes, for example. And these are chemicals that cause DNA to mutate. Some mutations are not necessarily caused by a mutagen. They are simply a spontaneous mutation. That means that they occur in the absence of a mutagen and simply by chance. So DNA polymerase normally, remember, has a proofreading ability. It has the ability to recognize when it makes a mistake and it cuts out that nucleotide that was put in incorrectly and it replaces it with the correct one. But it doesn't always recognize when it makes a mistake. On average, about one in every 10 to the ninth, so one billionth base pair, we're going to see a mutation occur simply by chance. So not all mutations are caused by mutagens. And so the last part of this lecture, we're going to talk about genetic transfer and recombination. So when we talk about gene transfer, we have been talking about vertical gene transfer, which happens during reproduction between generations of cells. So like, for example, when we learned about mitosis, that is an example of a vertical gene transfer. Or when bacteria do binary fission, which is their way to reproduce asexually, that is vertical gene transfer. That genetic information is passed from one generation to the next. We can also have what is referred to as the horizontal gene transfer. And that is that we get the transfer of genes between cells of the same generation. So we are going to have two different cells 
that are going to exchange genetic information. And so we're going to talk about the three main types of horizontal gene transfer that can happen in bacteria, for example. So first one is going to be transformation. We will also talk about transduction, followed by conjugation. And so let's talk about horizontal gene transfer. Now, horizontal gene transfer can be advantageous for bacteria because the types of genes that can transfer from one bacteria to another can give bacteria the ability to be resistant to temperature changes, meaning that they can live in a more broad range of temperatures. It can allow bacteria to produce pigments, and often these pigments are going to cause disease. It may basically give bacteria the ability to be antibiotic resistant. So a bacteria that is resistant to an antibiotic might pass that gene to another bacteria that does not have resistance, and now the receiving bacteria is also antibiotic resistant. Horizontal gene transfer can transfer genes that are used for virulence, which basically means disease-causing ability. So toxins, for example. Capsule production. Capsules are the sticky slime on the outside of bacteria, and it makes bacteria a thousand times more resistant to antibiotics. It also allows bacteria to be what we call antiphagocytic, meaning that it's more difficult for the phagocytes, the white blood cells, to do phagocytosis and to engulf them and to get rid of them. And so having a capsule is going to give bacteria an advantage. And so these are the types of genes that can transfer within horizontal gene transfer. One cell has it, it's going to pass that gene to another cell. Now some examples of um, bacteria that have done horizontal gene transfer we can have Streptococcus pyogenes. Streptococcus pyogenes is the bacteria that causes strep throat. However, if this bacteria acquires a gene for an erythrogenic toxin, that Streptococcus pyogenes is now able to cause what's called toxic shock syndrome. And if you think of toxic shock syndrome, this is basically, you see the warning on a box of tampons because this bacteria will eat blood as a food source. And so the warning is on tampons to say, hey, change the tampon often, because if this bacteria gets in the vaginal area and it has the ability to eat the blood as a food source, it's gonna cause an infection and it might lead to toxic shock syndrome. E. coli 0157H7. So you hear of E. coli causing food poisoning, for example. But what you might not realize is that everybody has E. coli in your gut. You all have it. It's part of your normal flora in your gut. Standard E. coli doesn't cause food poisoning because you already have it in your gut. However, there is a strain of E. coli, that's the O157H7. That strain of E. coli has acquired what's called a Shiga toxin. A Shiga toxin was acquired from Shigella. This is a different type of bacteria. And Shigella hooked up with E. coli, and Shigella got its gene for the Shiga toxin transferred to E. coli. And so now E. coli has the Shiga toxin. It acquired the gene for the toxin. It produces the toxin, and patients get this very violent diarrhea. Oftentimes it's bloody um, as well. And so these types of genes can be transferred from one bacteria to another. Remember, bacteria don't reproduce sexually. They only reproduce asexually. So when we're talking about horizontal gene transfer, it's between cells of the same generation. It's not used during reproduction. So we're going to talk about ways for horizontal gene transfer to happen and how DNA gets into the cell. However, what we need to understand is not only does it need to get into the cell, but it also needs to be incorporated into the recipient's DNA. And so what happens is, is we get what's called genetic recombination. And that is the exchange of genes between two DNA molecules. And this is going to happen when we get crossing over between two chromosomes and they break and they rejoin. So if we look here, this is our donor DNA, and let's say, for example, maybe this has the gene for antibiotic resistance. 
And so this donor DNA is in the lavender and the recipient chromosome is in pink. And so we get this cut in the donor DNA and the donor DNA is going to align with a complementary sequence on the recipient's chromosome. And so this is why genetic transfer often happens between closely related bacteria because you have to have similar sequences in order for this recombination to occur. And so these um, complementary base pairs are going to align and then this RecA protein is going to basically catalyze the joining of these two strands. It's gonna link them together and we're going to get this exchange of genetic information. And so notice that the donor DNA picked up some of the recipient, it has this DNA sequence here, and the recipient chromosome has some of the donor DNA. So now the recipient has the gene for antibiotic resistance, for example. And so this is how these DNA sequences become incorporated and become part of the recipient is you get this genetic recombination, you get this crossing over between the donor DNA and the recipient chromosome. So the last part of this lecture is actually going to be derived from Professor Derek Boyer, uh, who also teaches microbiology at OCC. And so the rest of this video is from his lecture. So this is actually his video, but I'm using the end to put it in with the other part of the genetics lecture. In your book, just for reference, so feel free to refer back to this um, if you want to summarize these uh, fairly quickly. Uh, but we're going to go through these in detail in the next few slides. Let's look at transformation then first. So this mechanism of horizontal gene transfer involves a bacterial cell dying. So somewhere out there, or maybe somewhere in there, like in your gut, you can have you know, trillions of bacterial cells, um, and a bacterial cell eventually dies. Remember, bacteria may only live two to three days, so there's a lot of turnover where bacteria are dying each day, and as they die and their cell ruptures, it may release DNA. When the cell breaks apart during lysis, some of that DNA will come out in little fragments, and then that DNA potentially could be useful to um, living cells that if they can pick up that DNA and take it in, um, then the recipient cells, as they're referred to, can change how they behave. And they're said to be transformed then. So a recipient cell, when we think about our laboratory experiment, these are referred to as competent cells. A competent recipient is a bacterial cell that can take up that DNA from the dead donor. And once that DNA is taken in, there's a chance that one or more sets of genes could be adopted or uh, recombined into the, the recipient's um, genome. And so then this can bring about many changes to a bacterial cell. Um, and uh, some cells are naturally competent and can do this according to their natural mechanisms. In laboratory, we did a transformation experiment where we had to chemically treat the cells using calcium chloride, which allowed them to take up the DNA by us, you know, using a chemical treatment to destabilize their membrane. Um, so if you can recall back to that transformation experiment, um, that was an important way to understand transformation. Um, here's a summary of it. Transformation, naked DNA, transfers from dead donor to a living recipient that's described as competent. Um, it's important to conceptualize that competent cells are recipients that are usually young, actively growing and dividing, and or have receptors. I mean, the, generally they would have to have a mechanism for taking that DNA in. And we can say that um, donor and recipient are usually either of the same species or very closely related um, genetically speaking. And so transformation has profound consequences. Um, bacteria can evolve to produce certain virulence factors by picking up that naked DNA. Remember, virulence is disease-causing ability, so uh, that could be the ability, maybe a newfound ability to make fimbriae or, or capsules. What about capsule production? Or perhaps antibiotic resistance? Or lastly, toxin production. But why limit, why would a cell limit itself to just one? Sometimes transformation can result 
in an uptake of more than one of these types of virulence factors. I see that antibiotic resistance was also listed here um, additionally. So you get the idea. Transformation can bring about some profound changes in bacterial cells. Transformation was first discovered and described when a man by the name of Frederick Griffith performed a famous experiment, now known as Griffith's experiment, all the way back in 1928. He was researching a possible vaccination for the most common form of bacterial pneumonia caused by an organism called Streptococcus pneumoniae. Griffith was growing Streptococcus pneumoniae on plates, and when he looked at the colonies, he described them as having a smooth appearance. And this is due to the fact that Streptococcus pneumoniae um, covers itself, it surrounds itself in a capsule like we see here, and these encapsulated bacteria are known to be antiphagocytic. They can defeat the alveolar macrophages of the lungs and cause fluid buildup, sometimes to the point of a, a deadly disease. Griffith had taken these encapsulated Streptococcus pneumoniae cells and injected them into mice. And when these cells were injected into the mouse, the mouse was overwhelmed and its immune system failed to be able to eliminate this pathogen, and so death resulted. Griffith performed a second experiment with a different plate of cells that he described as rough. Interestingly, these cells were the same species, still Streptococcus pneumoniae. These strep pneumoniae cells, however, were mutant in the fact that they did not have their usual encapsulated protective structure. So strep pneumoniae without the capsule, we we'll refer to as unencapsulated, not enough room there, uncapsulated, were injected into the mouse and the mouse lived because the mouse's immune system was able to recognize and defeat this form of Streptococcus pneumoniae. In a third part of Griffith's experiment, Griffith took the normally dangerous um, encapsulated smooth strain of Streptococcus pneumoniae, as we see here, but he heat killed the cells. If you heat the cells up enough and denature them, then they will die. His hope was that if he took these heat-killed Streptococcus pneumoniae cells and put them in a syringe and then injected the mouse, that the mouse might have an opportunity to build up some immunity and also avoid a deadly scenario. Um, in this case, the autopsy revealed that there were no live cells, so no pathogens were found in the plate because the ones that were injected were dead to begin with. Where Griffith's experiment becomes quite famous and revealed a new discovery, led to a discovery that was very surprising, was when Griffith got the idea that if he mixed heat-killed encapsulated organisms, so heat-killed smooth, with, along with, live, rough cells, that this mixture would be something that perhaps would do a good job at making for a, a form of a vaccine where you have a killed pathogen, but then you also have some live um, non-pathogenic or rough strain Streptococcus pneumoniae. But much to his surprise, this mixture killed the mouse. And even more fascinating, after the mouse was dead, the autopsy showed that only live rough, I'm sorry, live smooth bacteria were found in the plate, no rough. And this was a big mystery because initially heat killed smooth cells were injected. So they were dead, they shouldn't have been alive, and they weren't. But yet at the end of uh, the autopsy, the mouse had produced from its blood uh, only live smooth pathogens um, you have Streptococcus pneumoniae. And so this was actually a way in which transformation was revealed to be a, a real phenomenon whereby the heat-killed smooth cells um, had released DNA, uh, part of the DNA were genes for capsule production, and that those genes for cap capsule production had been taken up into the live rough strain. And that live rough strain gained a newfound ability to become capsule producers and that allowed them to defy and defeat the mouse's immune system and so transformation occurred in this case and this is what Griffith's experiment had revealed um, had happened was that 
genetic material could be transferred um, from a dead donor to a living recipient. Another type of, a second type of horizontal gene transfer is called bacterial conjugation. Bacterial conjugation involves um, a living donor that then copies its DNA and transfers it over to a living recipient. One, we would, re, we would refer to as a gram-negative uh, arrangement here through the sex pillus. So gram-negative cells that are able to undergo bacterial conjugation will produce a sex pillus if it's what's called F-positive. An F-positive cell, the F is in reference to fertility, the fertility factor. And for short, that fertility is referred to as F, fertility factor, or F factor as in for short. And when an F positive cell, which has the F factor, expresses this gene, it will start to extend the sex pillus out into its external, into its external environment. And a so-called F minus cell will act as a recipient. And this is a one-way street. The recipient receives the DNA that's donated over from its F positive donor. So the F positive is the donor. And this is a very important way in which bacteria may be able to then share genes across the same generation. Um, in this picture on the left here, we can estimate, maybe take a guess that the donor has fimbriae. We can see the long um, spiky protein structures here, fimbriae, used for attachment in the environment. And then the F minus cell may be receiving genes for fimbriae production across the sex pillus. <clears throat> so after this act of conjugation, it may be later observed that the F minus recipient um, could become able to produce fimbriae as well as maybe receiving a copy of the F factor. And in the next slide, we'll see what those possibilities are um, where an F positive cell can transform, well, in a sense, um, cause an F minus cell to become in which a sex pillus is not produced, is not present, but conjugation can still occur in which the donor and the recipient line up alongside one another and form a so-called mating bridge. The mating bridge does not, does not require the pillus, but nevertheless, DNA can be copied from donor to recipient. This is still an act of conjugation, but via a mating bridge, as opposed to conjugation in gram negatives, where we see the sex pillus will act as a uh, transfer setup. Here's a figure taken from our textbook showing how conjugation can occur in E. coli. And so in E. coli, on the left figure here, we see that the F positive cell is, is able to make a sex pillus, has sex pillus production. And so the F factor can be copied over from the donor to the recipient that's re referred to as F minus because initially it lacks the F factor. It lacks the F factor, but after conjugation occurs, where genes are transferred over from donor to recipient, you can end up with the F minus cell being transformed into an F positive cell. So this is one result of how conjugation can change a recipient cell um, so that it evolves, so that it becomes something, it becomes capable of something that it was not capable of previously. Conjugation uh, is an act that happens between two living cells. Um, different types of genetic information can be transferred over um, plasmids, which are referred to as extra chromosomal pieces of DNA, um, small little elements of DNA uh, that can exist in addition to the normal chromosomal DNA can be transferred. Uh, also, pieces or portions of the chromosome may be copied or transferred as well during conjugation. The F factor um, 
is uh, responsible for sex pillus production, um, and it may or may not be transferred during conjugation. So this is something that if the F factor gets copied over completely, then the F minus recipient can become F positive. If it does not get copied over completely um, or at all, then the F minus cell can remain F minus, but maybe still receive some other important genetic information. So there isn't a rule that says that the F factor must be copied over in all instances. And so in those instances where the F factor fails to, um, to be copied over, there's a bit of a, an unusual event that accompanies this in many cases. And so we see here in this diagram how this would work. Um, this little circle here is a plasmid. A plasmid is a little extra circular piece of DNA that's not part of the chromosome. And um, this F factor, I mean, this plasmid has the F factor on it. And so this F positive cell may experience a change at some point during its life where for reasons that are not always understood, the plasmid may join like we see here. The plasmid can um, become part of the chromosome and insert itself. When the F factor inserts itself into the chromosome, it becomes an integrated F factor and a cell that has an integrated F factor is what's called an HFR cell. So HFR <clears throat> means high frequency of recombination. So to explain what that means, high frequency of recombination, um, first of all, it's the status that we see here. Um, an HFR cell has to have an integrated F factor. And so then, why is it high frequency of recombination? Um, we'll look at the consequences of having the F factor integrated. So um, that'll be in the next slide, but let's make sure we get this definition, integrated F factor. Remember, integrated means into the chromosome, into the chromosomal DNA of the F positive organism. So here we see that an HFR cell, which is still F positive, right? HFR cells have the F factor, so they, uh, they have the ability to make the sex pillus. So they do. And in that instance, when they hook up with an F minus recipient, the HFR cell has to decide what part of its chromosome and or F factor it's going to copy over. And most often what happens is the part where it starts to copy seems to break apart right in the middle of the F factor. And so what happens is, is a cut happens right here. Uh, this is called the origin of replication. And in this origin of replication, it's then making it difficult to highly unlikely that all of the F factor will be copied over. And you might be wondering why that would happen, but um, we don't always know. So it's just something that's observed to happen is the HFR cell will cut in the middle of the F factor there at, at the so-called origin of replication and then begin to copy over DNA. So part of the F factor and neighboring genes next to the F factor will be transferred. And as they're copied over and transferred, then the recipient cell gets an interesting package. It can have any number of different genes that could be advantageous to making the F minus cell newly capable, right? That's what recombinant means here, is that the F minus cell may have, um, you know, new characteristics. So things like toxin production or capsule production, um, you know, antibiotic resistance, etc. But this recipient cell will not have received the um, the entire F factor. So therefore, it's still F minus. And that's just what ends up happening. Um, so unusual event. And um, but we do observe that this does happen. And uh, so it's a way in which bacteria can evolve by sharing genes. Um, and uh, so we have HFR
mating with um, the F minus recipient that stays F minus, but can still get genes that give it a way to change over time. So in, in summary, conjugation um, involves an F factor that might incorporate into the DNA, and if so, the cell becomes classified as HFR for high frequency of recombination. Um, F minus cells stay F minus, but they may have received new genes, so they are referred to as recombinant F minus. Um, this is because they didn't get the whole F factor, so they're not F positive, um, but they still evolve. And so we see a variety of virulence factors, um, which might include, just like earlier when I mentioned in transformation, things like uh, uh, capsule production, uh, fimbriae, toxins, or maybe antibiotic resistance. There's no limit to what these cells could receive. A third type of horizontal gene transfer is transduction. And transduction is carried out by bacteriophages. Bacteriophage are oftentimes simply referred to as phage or phage viruses. And these viruses are known to specifically attach to bacteria. So here's a little phage virus here. And what that phage virus is doing is it's attaching to the outer portion, the cell wall of a bacterial cell, and then successfully injecting its DNA into the bacterial cell. And ultimately, the mission of any virus is to take its genetic material and reprogram the cell to, to make more phage viruses, or whatever virus it is, they just wanna make more viruses. Say so they reprogram the cell, and that's the normal cycle of a phage. The reprogramming is in an effort to make new phages. And these newly formed phage occasionally make a mistake. Something unexpected can happen where the new phage may package bacterial DNA instead of its intended viral DNA. So new phages may package bacterial genes. And these genes or DNA from this uh, host cell then could be transferred to a future recipient. And so when the host bursts open with a whole bunch of newly formed phage, one of these phages might just pick up some bacterial genes from this recipient, uh, or I mean from this previous host, and inject it into a new recipient. Now at this point, this recipient is uh, pretty lucky because instead of getting the genes for a phage viral infection, um, perhaps a happy accident can occur here. And we say that because um, the recipient cell is now getting bacterial genes from elsewhere uh, without the downside of uh, forming uh, a viral infection. And so what we can have here, at least in this in this particular diagram is a cell that picks up um, new genes and becomes recombinant and able then to gain new abilities. So um, these cells down here have changed. They've evolved through the action, through an unintentional action of a phage virus. So recombinant cells result. Transduction in a general summary involves a virus known as a bacteriophage or simply phage that is able to move DNA and one way of determining that is it acts as a genetic vector. So it's picking up DNA and passing it from a donor initial host over to a future recipient host. So the donor DNA, if, if transduction is successful, can then um, incorporate into new recipient DNA. The donor and recipient are thought of as being in the same species or maybe even in the same subspecies or strain because bacteriophage are very specific to their host um, in the vast majority of cases. There are some rare instances where a bacteriophage could adapt to infect more than one species. Uh, those are so-called promiscuous phage. That's kind of a 
funny term for them, um, where, you know, things can get a bit fast and loose. But um, in most cases, we say that the same species are involved, or even the same subspecies, so even more specific than just um, all of one given species. So phages, um, when they do this act of transduction, uh, we can further specify that there are two uh, major types of transduction events. There's generalized transduction, and there's specialized transduction. The one that I went over in the previous slide was a model for generalized transduction. Generalized transduction, as it was outlined a couple of slides ago, um, describes the way that uh, transducing phage operate when there is a, a random transfer of any genes. Um, so a donor is infected with the bacterial phage, and then fragments of the donor bacterial's DNA is surrounded by the virus's capsid. The virus capsid is a protein shell that wraps up the genetic material for the virus, and then the virus can carry the DNA over to, um, to a recipient. But before that can happen, the donor has to lyse after uh, a load of viruses are reproduced. Um, a, an infected bacterial cell could release anywhere from uh, 50 to a couple hundred new viruses. And some of those viruses that are released, if they happen to have packaged up bacterial DNA, they can take that donor, donor DNA, deliver it to a recipient, and then if that combines, then you have a, a recombinant cell. Um, however, there is a chance that this process could fail. And so if a donor cell fails to adopt the, the new DNA that it's been given, and this is what's called abortive. Um, so the recipient cell may not actually receive the DNA and, um, and successfully change by recombining that. And so it, it may destroy the DNA. But if in fact transduction is successful, then uh, that transduction event could involve the transfer of many virulence factors, like mentioned in the previous slides, uh, ranging anything from uh, capsule production to uh, to fimbria, um, to the ability to produce uh, one or more various toxins uh, and or uh, things like antibiotic resistance. And so uh, many different genes may be transferred over during a generalized transduction event, but it's done so in a random nature. A second type of transduction um, is, is called specialized transduction. And specialized transduction is, as the name implies, only specific genes will be transferred. Okay, so uh, we're saying that phage viruses get in, but when they pick up bacterial genes that they may carry to a new recipient, um, only uh, specific genes will be transferred during specialized transduction. And this event is a bit more complicated um, because um, the less than random nature of things involves something called lysogenic phages. So lysogenic phages, as they're sometimes called, produce what's called a mild infection or a silent infection. Temperate, if you were talking about the weather or the climate, would mean An infection with a lysogenic phage is one where the bacteria may have a period of, of silence. And so the way that this works is, is that the donor that gets the viral DNA from, from a lysogenic phage, okay, so lysogenic uh, phage DNA goes in, um, but then instead of just taking the cell over and producing more phage viruses right away and causing the cell to burst, Instead, the viral DNA goes in and it, in, it integrates, it incorporates in to the bacterial DNA. So bacterial 
DNA combines, or I should say, fuses with the viral phage DNA. And this is referred to as a prophage. So a prophage is the term that we use to, to state um, that a bacterium has fused its DNA with the phage DNA. And during this time, we get a what's called a, a period of silence or lysogeny. So lysogeny is a time of, of waiting um, where the virus is there, but it's not active. It's not doing anything. So the virus is inactive or silent. But after some amount of time, the virus may become active again. Something triggers it. It's not always known what these triggering events are. Um, to review this, uh, to, to clarify, you have a phage, and not just any kind of phage. We'll call it a temperate or lysogenic phage. And what this temperate or lysogenic phage does is it infects the bacterial cell. So infection occurs. And then that host will undergo a um, will undergo what's called lysogeny. And lysogeny is a waiting period. It is, um, it's, it's a silent infection. And for how much time, we don't know. It could last generations, actually. So this bacterium could grow and multiply several times, um, all the while having uh, this, this dangerous viral DNA in there. But following some sort of trigger or activation, then the final stage would be an active viral infection again. And so uh, this is referred to as a lytic cycle. A lytic cycle is where the virus becomes active and, uh, and the cell will burst open. Um, and this lytic cycle um, will take with it uh, phages that only transfer specific genes. So the way that this happens is that the viral DNA, when it pops out of the donor DNA during the activation or the trigger, triggering event, is that um, the neighboring donor DNA is, is next to the viral DNA. So the viral DNA, as it pops out, takes a little bit of the neighboring um, bacterial DNA. And so this can transfer very specific genes depending on where the uh, viral DNA it was inserted. So specialized transduction ultimately, just like um, other horizontal gene transferring events, can involve the transfer of capsules, fimbriae, toxin-producing genes, antibiotic resistance, you name it. All right, so one thought question that came from our book asks E. coli which we know is found naturally in the human large intestine, um, is, is a part of our normal flora. It's beneficial, but we know that there are dangerous strains of E. coli. So we've all heard about reports in the news in which um, E. coli has caused um, foods to be contaminated and pulled off of uh, shelves and, and out of grocery stores um, nationwide, if not you know, on a global scale, um, mainly because of, of agribusiness, um, the production of foods, whether they be uh, dairy products, um, where there are cattle. Um, the cattle also have E. coli as normal flora. Uh, but then there are strains that are, we're not familiar with um, in the human body. They're foreign to us. And one really dangerous strain is the E. coli designated O157H7. And one of the ways in which we know that this particular deadly E. coli is different is in its production of something called Shiga toxin. And Shiga toxin causes bleeding and major trauma to the large intestine, uh, down in the colon and large intestine area. Uh, this toxin will cause bleeding and then E. coli can get into the blood and cause a septic episode. Um, what we do know about Shiga toxin is that its name uh, stems from the fact that it comes from a different, entirely different pathogen called Shigella. Uh, 
And Shigella is a diarrheal pathogen that's well known to cause um, deadly diarrhea and septic shock. Um, but it's supposed to be found in Shigella, not in E. coli. So uh, when it was discovered that this unusual variety of E. coli called the uh, O157H7 um, was found to be dangerous because of this virulence factor that it had picked up called Shiga toxin. Um, well, the big question was, was how did it get it? So how did E. coli acquire the gene from Shigella? You might be surprised to learn that the answer is from an, a transducing phage. So an unexpected event occurred in which transduction occurred from a bacteriophage that originally was able to infect Shigella, um, but then somehow that phage uh, became less specific and had the ability to take genes from Shigella, which were undoubtedly in the gut of an infected person, and then float over to some of the normal E. coli um, and, uh, and then transfer those genes over. Um, whether that happened in an animal, like a, a farm animal, like a cow, or a human, um, we really don't know. But uh, a transducing phage was discovered to be responsible for this event. Um, although it's unexpected, it's an interesting uh, development that um, geneticists were able to figure. In the remaining handful of slides, I'd like to explain plasmids and transposons as genetic vehicles, uh, pieces of DNA that are additional. They may not occur initially within an organism's uh, genetic package, and they can move around, and they can contain elements that are above and beyond what a basic chromosome in a bacterial cell or other living cell might contain. So a plasmid by definition is considered additional genetic material above and beyond the chromosome. So extra chromosomal. And plasmids are not just limited to bacteria which are prokaryotic, uh, they've also been discovered to be found in many types of eukaryotes as well. And plasmids, when they exist independently of a chromosome, are found to be small circular pieces of DNA. And plasmids are interesting in another respect as well, which is that they have the ability to direct their replication in a self-directed sense. They self-replicate and they can exist in high or low copy number. And this is just a way of referring to the fact that sometimes the numbers of a given plasmid can increase to quite high numbers. A high copy number plasmid may replicate itself dozens of times. There could be 50 copies of a plasmid floating around inside of a cell um, in a high number. However, there are times when plasmids can exist in uh, just one copy or a few copies, and so they would be considered low copy number plasmids. Um, plasmids are influenced by their genetic sequences um, to, uh, to self-replicate. Um, that subject goes deeper into genetics beyond what this course is going to have time to address. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, plasmids are also considered to be non-essential pieces of genetic information, but that doesn't make them unimportant by any means. Uh, plasmids are, have been found to make all the difference in some cases with respect to highly resistant infections, um, so-called R plasmids, right? R plasmids, the R is in reference to resistance. And so R can refer most often to resistance to antibiotics. Um, here is one particular plasmid with a so-called R factor. Um, this is a picture taken from our book. On the right, it shows uh, a lot of different parts of the plasmid ranging from an origin of replication where it can be copied. Um, there's an area, uh, if we go clockwise from there, where we can see uh, mercury resistance. Um, we can see uh, 
genes for things like uh, sulfonamide drugs, sulfa drugs, which are a, a major class of antibiotics, uh, streptomycin, a different type of antibiotic, CML is for chloramphenicol. And so here we have a whole portion of the R plasmid that it has a cassette of antibiotic resistance um, genes, uh, TET, that's for tetracycline down here. Um, and interestingly, on the other side of this plasmid, there are genes for the F factor. Um, if you remember, the F factor forms the sex pillus. F stands for fertility. Um, and, uh, and so the F factor has the instructions that give rise to the sex pillus um, and conjugation. So uh, we know these plasmids exist. Um, this is an example of a sequence of one such plasmid. We can see in this picture here on the left, um, every one of these loops found in this picture of the cytoplasm taken really close up. This has been magnified millions of times um, <clears throat> and uh, is a scanning electron micrograph of the cytoplasm inside of a bacterial cell and it's showing um, various plasmids. Um, every single one of these loops is a plasmid. They're all plasmids. This is a high copy number plasmid, as we can see. <clears throat> so plasmids um, can be transferred over during um, transducing events, uh, during conjugation, uh, even during transformation. Another uh, type of genetic vector uh, are what are called uh, transposons, and a vector if you recall, is, is um, some sort of mechanism um, that carries genes, a genetic vector, um, and in this case, transposons are referred to as jumping genes. Um, like plasmids, they are small segments of DNA. They can exist in a circle or a loop, um, but they are not referred to as plasmids necessarily because they were discovered to, be, to behave uh, more loosely than plasmids, to have more possibilities than a plasmid. Uh, they were first discovered by a scientist in the 50s who, um, by the name of Barbara McClintock, and she was studying how corn kernels could have different colors and that the pigments that gave rise to the different colored corn kernels was actually uh, due to the fact that transposons had allowed genes to jump around inside the corn plant and produce these different colors. And transposons since that time have been found to move from one part of a chromosome to another, so on the same chromosome, or even more unusually, um, to different chromosomes, um, or even onto plasmids. So there really are no rules, it seems, for these transposons. They can jump around um, and they also can uh, move without replicating. So they can copy themselves and move, or they can just pick up and move and not replicate before such an act. They have been found in all types of cellular life, from prokaryotes to eukaryotes to even viruses. Uh, so transposons are kind of a, a discovery that breaks all the rules, so to speak, as to where genes can remain um, it shows us that evolution has possibilities, um, at least through transposons, to move genetic material from places that we never thought um, could jump from one place to another. So as it says here, uh, transposons can jump between unrelated species as well. And one of the most problematic discoveries within the world of transposons was when it was discovered that uh, a very problematic type of antibiotic resistance called vancomycin resistance had transferred itself from the um, infamous VRE, which stands for uh, vancomycin resistant enterococcus, um, which has, has killed people um, for many years, decades really, since the 1980s um, in hospital patients, that that form of genetic resistance antibiotic resistance had been transferred over to Staph aureus. Vancomycin 
previous to this event was a fairly reliable kind of last line, uh, last resort drug for staph aureus patients, um, staph infection patients who had had uh, MRSA problems, methicillin resistant staph aureus. Um, we now know today that uh, roughly 25% of MRSA patients, uh, of, of staph infection patients, uh, have methicillin resistant staph aureus. And so it's much more common that we rely on uh, vancomycin antibiotic to treat those staph infections. Unfortunately, not all of those patients will respond to vancomycin therapy, and it seems in, uh, in large part due to this, in, uh, this event where transposons have brought vancomycin resistance to staph aureus. Here's a figure just visually giving you an idea of all the possibilities that transposons um, have in their existence within cells. So um, you can see here, looking from one area to the next, if this is where the transposon is. That transposon could move to a different area on the chromosome that it exists. It could copy itself and then move on to several locations on a chromosome or transfer to a different chromosome entirely. Or in this case, finally, we're seeing that the transposon could just uh, excise itself, uh, cut itself right out of the chromosome, and then move on to some other place. So uh, these are the possibilities that transposons have. And it gives us a real eye-opening perspective on how bacterial evolution, um, genetic evolution in maybe any life form um, could be influenced by the presence of transposons and their movement through various species. Uh, so we have a, a, a final concept check, and it's asking the question, which of the following mechanisms of horizontal transfer involves the transfer of bacterial DNA through a bacteriophage? So um, we'll just skip right to it. Um, a bacteriophage um, has to uh, be involved in what's called transduction, if it's moving genes around. Um, but let's make sure that we understand why the wrong answers are wrong. First of all, transposition um, is involving transposons, but not necessarily specifically um, bacteriophage. So we would not pick that as the one best answer. Conjugation, if you guys recall, is uh, where living two live bacteria hook up in a sexual act and um, DNA is copied and transferred over from donor to recipient. And transformation is uh, does not apply because a dead donor has to just release its DNA, spill it out into the environment, um, and a, a living recipient has to pick up that DNA, a competent cell, and, um, and no phage has to be involved there. So the answer is transduction. I hope you guys are able to recall that easily at this point. And uh, finally, we have a slide about just the idea of genes and evolution in general. Um, when studying genetics, it should be kept in mind that organisms change over time due to all the mechanisms um, from uh, mutation, whether it's random or uh, through um, events that you know expose cells to mutagens or chemicals. Um, environmental stresses. We also know then that uh, recombination can occur. Um, so, you, you know, recombination can be these um, vertical gene transfers uh, from uh, parent cell to daughter cells, and then you can have all of the uh, horizontal gene transfers, right? Transformation, transduction, um, uh, conjugation, and so a lot of movement of genetic information and evolution from that. And and lastly, just it's sort of a Darwinian um, outlook here, right? Uh, survival of the fittest. Um, organisms that are best suited for their environment will be naturally selected for. Uh, the ones that have the genes that allow them to survive for longer are, um, are the ones then that we're going to see more and more in the future, whereas the ones that are no longer fit will die out. And we know that uh, no matter how many antibiotics we come up with to try to defeat the bad guys, 
um, they do have these sneaky ways of mutating um, and recombining their genes with their neighbors. And so uh, through a process of natural selection, um, uh, the, the fittest organisms, organisms with the resistance factors, um, they will stick around and they will eventually uh, become plentiful if we keep the same strategy of trying to control those organisms. And that is it for genetics, everyone. Um, and the remaining slides are slides that uh, are just um, for reference. If you have a little reading that you'd like to do that's um, just taken from a textbook that could give you a little depth and understanding